everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. Commissioner Lori Stegman is excused. Audience members, I want to start by asking you to please silence your electronic devices. I would also like to remind folks that in addition to the audience in this room, we also have people watching and listening online. Please consider your language in comments and testimony today. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please mute your mic when not speaking. And when presenting, make sure to unmute your mic and turn on your camera. For all presenters, please state your name for the record before speaking or responding to questions. May I have a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner Beeson seconds. Approval of the consent calendar. Opportunity for public comment on non-agenda matters. This is the time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it is your turn to speak, I'll call your name and unmute you or call you to the presenter's table. I will set a timer for two minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up, at which point please wrap up our sentence. Um, we received eight verbal testimonies and 26 written testimonies, which have been shared with board members and staff. Um, I'm gonna start with virtual testimony today. Uh, our first speaker is oops, uh, Dylan. Plummer, one second. Um, Dylan, you're unmuted and you have two minutes. You may begin. You just have to unmute on your end. There we go. For this opportunity to testify today, my name is Dylan Plummer and I'm a senior organizing strategist with the Sierra Club, working across Oregon and Washington on building decarbonization. On behalf of the Sierra Club's members and supporters in Multnomah County and our over 70,000 members and supporters across the state, I'm testifying to support the commission to pursue policies to equitably electrify new and existing homes and buildings and eliminate the use of polluting methane gas in Multnomah County. Specifically, we support Multnomah County to schedule time ahead of Earth Day to pass a resolution to recognize the myriad health and climate impacts associated with gas and to direct staff to develop clean air standards to address the significant emissions associated with the combustion of fossil fuels in homes and buildings. Burning fossil fuels such as gas and propane to heat homes and businesses generates a range of dangerous air pollutants that endanger health, including nitrogen oxides, fine particulate matter, benzene, formaldehyde, and carbon monoxide. These air pollutants, also found in car exhaust, dirty the air Multnomah County residents breathe both indoors and outdoors, and increase the risk of health harms like asthma, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and premature death. Uh, gas field building equipment in Multnomah County specifically contributes significantly to air pollution, generating over a thousand tons of NOx pollution annually, which is about a three quarters as much as comes from all the gas power plants across the entire state of Oregon. Gas heating equipment is the second largest source of NOx pollution in the county behind cars and trucks. Uh, this is not just a, a health issue, but also an environmental justice issue. An analysis focused on Portland found that unhealthy air quality is more likely to occur in neighborhoods with high populations of Hispanic and African American residents. And according to data from EPA uh, EJ screen tool, areas in the county with high concentrations of low income and BIPOC communities are likely to experience levels of particulate matter, ozone, and other dangerous air pollutants two to three times higher than the rest of the city. In light of all this information and the information that I'm sure you've heard from other folks who've testified and written to you, I urge you to move quickly to pass a resolution ahead Time of- Time is up. Day. Thank you. Next, we have um, Jacqueline Leedy. Uh, Jacqueline, you're unmuted and you may begin. You just have to unmute on your end. Hello, Jacqueline, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to you. Um, we'll come back to you, Jacqueline. Uh, we'll, we'll go to in-person testimony. Um, I'll call four people at a time. Injured and pissed off, Jeshua Dunham, Cassie Cohen, and O.B. Hill, please come forward. <clears throat> My name's injured and pissed off and I was here last week. If you fail to cure the violations by 4-17-2024, your rental agreement will be terminated on the date set forth. Uh, cure thyself. Uh, nobody can do that. I've tried to explain that there's 7,200 uh, 
7,200 uh, languages in the world, and none of them would be able to cure themselves without doctors. Uh, maybe that's the reason why the death rate's so high. Uh, when I got, uh, since November 15th of 2010, I've had uh, elder abuse, uh, standing up a, a person with spinal cord injuries. It's 12% uh, scoliosis now because of the spinal curvature from the uh, hip surgery that was done on me and ignoring my spinal injuries. And of course, uh, I used to be a janitor and uh, that's four weeks away, uh, but that was when I was able to stand up and use my hands. Uh, I guess I've got to be a activist, a political activist again. I've went to jail before for my blindness to get disability, and I'm gonna sit here and uh, not move and cause a disturbance. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, I'm the Reverend Joshua Dunham, pastor of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Gresham, Oregon, also a resident of the Wilkes neighborhood in East Portland, a board member of Snowcap Community Charities, a founding team member of the Levinland and Housing Coalition, and a member of the East County Ministry Alliance, ECMA a collaborative organization of faith communities in East Portland County, in East Multnomah County, organizing and advocating for the needs of parishioners, residents, and neighbors in our county. I am here today because in my faith tradition, we follow Jesus the Christ, who was and is an asylum seeker. As a small child, he fled with his parents from his home county, from country to a foreign nation to seek safety, since his parents knew that his life was threatened. They didn't stop to make sure their path was a so-called legal one. They didn't spend time in an officially authorized refugee camp or wait for Egypt to declare that their homeland of Galilee, Judea, Palestine was on the officially sanctioned list for immigrants. They fled. They fled for their lives. So as a person of faith, I am calling upon you as the commissioners of this sanctuary county to make immediate funds available to support the emergency housing needs of newly arriving asylum seekers, and to create a comprehensive multi-year plan to support their housing needs in the long term, to stop making the care of people in need of support, such as asylum seekers, a one-off or short-term funding project, when we all know that people have not stopped coming to our country and our county to seek safety and support. I implore you to work with the leaders of Emerge, EMA, and ECMA to find human-centered solutions to support families in need arriving in our region on a daily basis, and to do so with urgency and Godspeed, to fight the wheels of bureaucracy that would delay or halt doing what is good and right, and to truly live out our calling as a sanctuary county, and as your sign says outside, to truly make sure all are welcome here. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning, um, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Cassie Cohen. My parents settled uh, in what is now called Portland in 1974. I was born at Best Kaiser Hospital near the Willamette River, or Walumt, which means blue waters in Ichiskin. Our river used to be blue once, Warm Springs tribal elder Darlene Foster reminds us. As the executive director of Portland Harbor Community Coalition, I, along with uh, dozens of others, humbly ask for your support to, the f to fund $500,000 of one-time funds to launch the first phase of what we're calling CHIRP, Cumulative Health Impacts and Resilience Plan in your fiscal year 2025 budget. This will activate a collective of frontline groups, researchers, and county health workers who are poised and eager to assist the county to help uh, chip, oh, oops, 
assist the county to chip away at over 100 years of exploitation and harm to the river's water, sediment, surrounding land, air, people, wildlife, such as fish, osprey, and lamprey. We know we are on the right track when our chirp momentum keeps building even prior to securing funding. Multnomah County's one-time commitment to fund this project will begin to address the long-standing cries of river workers and residents from diverse and under-resourced backgrounds over generations who feel the compounding impacts in our lungs, on our skin, in our organs, affecting our breast milk and our children's abilities to think clearly. Last year, local companies were fined for decades of spewing lead, zinc, mercury into the air, but nothing was done to address the impacts to people. We will learn from our neighbors in Washington and California to lead this effort with best practices on how to center frontline communities to ground truth, climate impacts, environmental justice impacts, super fun and industrial impacts, collecting qualitative and quantitative data in open source public facing virtual data hub. We intend for CHIRP to start the journey of community leaders and partners reassessing solutions to orient f infrastructure support, resource allocations and policy solutions that address resilience goals. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is O.B. Hill. Uh, community historian and child of the Vanport Flood. Less than two months before my seventh birthday, we walked up Denver Avenue, caught a bus, and left Vanport and looked back and saw our houses floating. You and I, we sweat and strain, bodies all racked and ache with pain. Toe that bar, lift that bell. We get a little drunk and we land in jail. That old, old man river, he don't say nothing, but he must know something. It just keeps on rolling. It keeps on rolling. He don't plant cotton, he don't pick taters, and them that does that are soon forgotten. But old oh, man river keeps on rolling along. Thank you, sir. Um, Jacqueline Leedy, are you available? It looks like you're unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, wonderful. Sorry about that earlier. Thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. Um, today I wanted to talk about some concerns that I have with Multnomah County Animal Shelter. Recently, there were two dogs in the custody of the shelter, Brutus and Jasmine who were destroyed under the authority of shelter management despite objections from the public citizens such as myself, as well as shelter volunteers. I won't have time to go into their history or individual timelines, but in summary, they were good dogs. They had wonderful notes. They were loved by staff and volunteers. They were both very friendly towards people. They both had anxiety, but the anxiety was never evaluated by a canine professional outside of the shelter's veterinarian who simply prescribed medication. Neither received any additional behavioral help in terms of time with canine behavior professionals because the shelter actually doesn't have any current partnerships or programs with one, to my understanding. What I see a lot from our shelter is this hyper-focus on the 90% live release metric. The 90% is an arbitrary number. 
Nowhere in the remaining 10% is there a safety net for the animals that are potentially being destroyed that were able to be treated or rehabilitated and successfully placed. Many forward-thinking shelters across the nation have long since abandoned the 90% metric because it was only ever supposed to be a goal, not a destination. For example, Williamson County Regional Animal Shelter, an open intake shelter in Texas reported a 96.26% live release rate for their fiscal year 2022. And of that, they euthanized less than 1% of all their canine intakes. That's down from 4.5% in 2012. They show progress every year, despite being in one of the toughest states in regards to animal welfare issues. I think that we should be doing is comparing ourselves to forward thinking shelters who are the leaders of the animal sheltering movement. Time is up. Thank you for your time. Next we have in person, um, we have Lightning and Addie Smith. Yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Humanity X. And I hope all you wonderful commissioners in the chair are gonna help this gentleman here from not being evicted. I really hope you're gonna do something about that. And I'll follow up with all of you to make sure you do. Now, another issue I have is with Commissioner Myron. Commissioner Myron, I'm a little bit hesitating on what I'm gonna to say to you because I really think you should have had that Crown Plaza already purchased and getting ready to operate in six months. I thought it was really a wonderful idea, well thought out, and I haven't heard anything, any discussion on having a briefing on that. I think we should have a briefing exactly where you're at, where the financing is at, and as we know, Metro is trying to take away the support of housing services money, which is your project, which is your project they're trying to take away. Again, I totally disagree with what they're doing. I would like Chair Peterson to step in and understand the Crown Plaza will bring you national attention. It will stop Metro from taking your money because your money is very much needed at Multnomah County. So again, Chair Peterson, for whatever reason, if you don't wanna have a briefing from things that have happened in the past during when you two were trying to get elected, and I know that can get very heated and sometimes people may take that personal, but this isn't about you two. This is about the people out in the community who need to have recovery housing, need to have addiction services, need to have treatment, and I don't have to explain to you what's going on out on the streets right now by the numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Save lives. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Addie Smith, A-D-D-I-E. I live in District 1. That's Miss Mirren's district. I am a registered voter. Amanda Miller is arresting probationers without telling them why they are being arrested, what violations of probation were allegedly committed, what are the steps a probation officer must take when they arrest someone suspected of pro violating probation. That is something that needs to be spelled out. That is something that the public needs to know. I'm extremely disappointed in Erica Pruitt, Travis Gamble, James Stevens, and Amanda Miller. Amanda Miller treats the black probationers whom report to her like slaves, as though we are still in times of enslavement. Her actions and behavior towards black probationers is that of a white slave owner. The racism and discrimination are even more prevalent in Oregon, Washington, and California than in southern states like Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, or even Texas. I would love to expound on that and take questions about that assessment. One of the things that I see a lot of is Democrats demanding that Republicans be disgusted by the behavior of Trump and the Republican Party. What I see very little of is accountability from the Democrats for the same discriminations they are yelling hypocritically at Republicans about. 
Black people simply are not safe in Portland or Oregon, the entire state. The people responsible for upholding the laws turn a blind eye to violations of those laws when they happen to black people. I'm here to raise concerns about the discrimination happening to the black probationers at the, sorry, I lost my spot. I'm here to raise concerns about the discrimination happening to the black probationers reporting to Amanda Miller and James Stevens at the Department of Community Justice. One of the things Erica Pruitt stated that she would be reducing that she would be doing is, quote, reducing racial and ethnic disparities within our system, end quote. She has none, not done that at all. In fact, it appears to be either the same or worse. Erica Pruitt is an African-American woman. You think working to confront racism and discrimination and provide meaningful solutions, even termination in instances of abuse of power and position. Please provide the job duties and responsibilities for Erica Pruitt and Travis Gamble. If you can print that or e Thank email you. it to me this morning, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That is all the public testimony for this morning. I will go on to R1. All right, thank you. R1, proclaiming March 31st, 2024 as Transgender Day of Visibility Community in Multnomah County, Oregon. So moved. <laughs> Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner uh, Brim Edwards seconds. Approval. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> approval of R1. Um, so I am very happy to turn over the presentation for R1 to Commissioner Sharon Myron to introduce today's proclamation. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am very excited to be introducing this today and I will have some more comments following the reading of the proclamation, but I want to first of all thank everyone who is here today, um, here in uh, clearly in spirit and in just celebration, and everyone who is uh, attending online. And through my years serving on the board, I have been very proud to sponsor this proclamation. And it's because this day not only acknowledges the significant and continued struggle for transgender rights, but unlike Transgender Day of Remembrance, it's an opportunity also to just highlight and celebrate our incredible transgender community. And today we'll have the pleasure to hear from some phenomenal individuals who work every day to improve the lives of gender expansive folks in our community. And I will hand it off to our first speaker, Ophelia Darling. Thank you, and we're gonna uh, make a little transition on the, um, down at the dais. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Can we assist him? We? Yeah, just wanna see if he needs assistance. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners. My name is Ophelia Darling. My pronouns are she and her. I am a lead library assistant at Central Branch, and I am the co-chair of PRISM. <clears throat> a question I often hear about trans visibility is, why bother? Why are trans people in my TV shows? I don't mind them existing, but why do they have to rub it in my face? Now, I could make plenty of arguments in favor of representation, but instead I'd like to talk about something more personal, internal visibility. Before I transitioned, I spent most of my life in isolation. I was born into a rural Oregon community of less than 200 people in the twilight years of the 20th century. The internet we know today did not exist, and the few queer characters on television were relegated to tragic cautionary tales or the butt of mean-spirited jokes. Queerness was not something that was discussed in my town, except as an insult. 
From my earliest awakening into the world, I was keenly aware that to be queer was something dangerous, something that invited ridicule and shame. And so, not seeing myself in this shallow image of queer, I concluded I must be normal and grew up without ever finding the language to describe why I felt so different inside. I first learned trans people existed from a daytime talk show in my early teens. Trans people entered my world as an oddity, something rare and bizarre, only seen on TV. When I moved to Portland for college, trans people became my classmates, real people who ate the same food, struggled with the same homework as me. After college, trans people became my friends, the girls I played Dungeons and Dragons with on Wednesday nights. As my understanding of trans people changed, I changed too, until one sunny afternoon in May, the truth became undeniable. I had been trans my entire life. Today, I can look back on this moment fondly, but at the time, my first thoughts were, oh God, please no. I could not imagine a future where being trans was better than staying in the closet. The story I learned growing up was that trans lives were worse than cis lives, and even after meeting so many actual trans people who seemed quite happy with their lives, thank you very much, I still believed it. It took me a long time to accept my gender as a blessing, not a curse, and I still struggle to remember this today. Compared to many, my transition has been extraordinarily privileged. I have never experienced violence for being trans. I did not lose friends or family. I did not lose my job or face workplace harassment. I have access to gender-affirming health care denied to so many. And yet, despite all these fortunes, I still grieve for the little girl in rural Oregon who never got to see how beautiful she was. My heart breaks for the young woman taught to loathe her own reflection, so afraid of being seen she made herself invisible. When people ask, why do we need trans visibility, my answer is simple. We need trans visibility so that trans people can recognize themselves in the world, so that trans children can grow up knowing who they are and that there is nothing wrong with them, so that trans adults who never had the chance to come out can know there is a name for what they feel and it's never too late to be yourself. If we do not have the language to describe our own experiences, we will spend our entire lives defined by someone else. Only by creating new stories for ourselves can we hope to build a world that truly celebrates our existence. And so, on this Trans Day of Visibility, it is my hope that any trans person listening will hear this message. You are beautiful. You are loved. You are perfect exactly the way you are. And there is a vast community of people like you who can't wait to say hello. Thank you. So for folks who are um, new to the boardroom, when we want to show applause, we usually go like this to, to show that during, and then after we vote on the proclamation, uh, applause is, is perfectly um, um, welcomed. Good morning. Hello, my name is Junix, and I am a member of the QDPOC ERG. I'm also the chairperson of Anakbayan East Portland, a grassroots organization of Filipino youth and students. And in the drag community, I'm known as Terra Tufilia. I was born in Portland, and I have always called this city my home. As a genderqueer, transsexual, and pansexual Filipino, today I'm speaking on behalf of Filipinos in the Philippines, such as Jennifer Lade, a Filipina who was murdered in 2014 by a United States Marine named Joseph Scott Pemberton. Jennifer Lade was not visible to Pemberton. When she became visible to him, he murdered her. During his trial, in which he was convicted of her murder, Pemberton's attorney said that when Pemberton murdered Lade, he acted to defend his honor after discovering Lade had a penis. Pemberton's defense argued that Pemberton was a victim of fraud committed by a sex worker and lashed out upon discovering that he'd been scammed. Lade's family has asserted that she wasn't a sex worker. Murder is, by definition, inhumane, but Jennifer Lade's life was taken in a matter particularly humiliating to her dignity, which is unfortunately common when it comes to the murder of trans people around the globe, whether it be in a district near Manila, in Oklahoma, where next Benedict was beaten in their high school by their classmates before reportedly committed completing suicide the next day, rest in peace, 
or here in Multnomah County where T.T. Gully was murdered at Rocky Butte Park five years ago. Rest in power. On a day where we are here to celebrate the trans community and our contributions to Multnomah County, I honor these deaths and stories to illustrate the ties between the United States and what happens to trans people around the globe. I want the commissioners to understand that in order to defend trans people here, we have to take up an internationalist perspective. The Philippines might feel far away to you, but the US has a huge influence on Philippine culture, in part due to the 48 years in which the Philippines was a colony of the United States. The Philippines might feel far away, but the seeds of the homeland are in this room. The Philippines is in me, and it's in the Filipino youth activists who came here today to not only honor the struggle of trans people for justice, but to also support migrants and asylum seekers here in Multnomah County who have been giving public testimony in this room. Portland and Oregon more broadly has seen an increase in asylum seekers arriving without a sponsor, friend, family, or other support. Asylum seekers are being funneled into an already overwhelmed homeless services system that is not equipped to meet their language, immigration, and cultural needs, and many of these services, including the emergency shelters for families with children, are only available after waiting for months on wait lists. Due to lack of government and social support, individuals and families, including children as young as four months old, have had to sleep outside and more folks are arriving every, each week. Nonprofits and grassroots organizations and advocates are bearing the brunt of the responsibility to fill this service gap, engaging in coordination, mutual aid, and other service and affordability efforts, but it's not enough to meet the need. Up until this week, migrants housed through Multnomah County funding were going to become unhoused at the end of this month. Now, their housing will be uh, extended until possibly mid-April. However, it's because the nonprofits are stepping in, not because the county's taking action. The county also released a homeless response action plan, which aims to reduce homelessness among LGBTQ plus community and people of color, yet doesn't mention support for unhoused immigrant community members, let alone the many asylum seekers without any friends or family to receive them. Some of the immediate calls uh, from the recently arrived migrants for Multnomah County are one, to meet with the community, take time to hear directly from the unstably housed asylum seekers, two, fund a reception center and emergency family shelter to operate as a day space for all community members and a nighttime emergency shelter for families, Three, access to mainstream interpretation, technology, and transportation. Without US SIM cards, asylum seekers actually can't call basic services like 211. Currently, a lot of the asylum seekers who've been coming here have given up on working with the commissioners and attending these meetings, partially because the translation services are so poor. I mean, in short, Multnomah County can either find the funding for asylum seekers now or pay far more expenses when these communities move from unstably housed to homeless. I know for a fact that this board cares about protecting trans kids, about trans youth having housing, and about protecting the health of trans people. There are trans asylum seekers in Multnomah County asking you to take action for the hundreds of migrants who are unstably housed, not just in the short term where migrants are living week to week, month to month, but for the long term. I'd like to ask the commissioners to reflect on what motivated you to become a commissioner in the first place. Wasn't there ever a moment when you thought to yourself, if only I had the power to make a difference, if only I could wave that magic wand and like solve all the suffering? This is that time. So maraming salamat for listening and for your solidarity. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Morning, commissioners. Can folks hear me? I've got on double mask, so. Um, my name is Babatunde Azubuke. Um, I also go by Zubby. My pronouns are they, them, and they, them. Um, I am the executive director and founder of Black and Beyond the Binary Collective. Um, I also want to preface, I've also had uh, several traumatic brain injuries, and so I might take a pause in time when I talk. Um, 
So Black and Beyond the Binary Collective builds the leadership, healing, and safety for Black, African, transgender, queer, non-binary, two-spirit, and intersex Oregonians. We envision a future that gives power back to our communities, celebrates self-expression, and preserves dignity, joy, and the future of Black, queer, and trans communities living fully liberated lives. I wrote a lot of things down in efforts to prepare for this conversation um, or for this moment to speak. And to be quite honest, I wanted just to speak from the heart. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I came out of the closet at the age of 14. And what that meant for me, um, living in rural Georgia, that I didn't have access to a home. I spent a lot of my childhood on the street in a lot of unsafe situations. and pushed into things that were not necessarily healthy for children. I come to this work and to this organization and founded Black and Beyond the Binary Collective because I feel like no LGBT youth should ever have to experience what I experience on the street. Part of our work at Black and Beyond the Binary Collective is providing housing in partnership with uh, Joe's as well as the city of Portland and JOIN to provide housing for folks that are on the streets, coming into the city, and already on the verge of eviction. And what I can tell you is that those funds are not enough. For context, this year alone, for our housing safety fund that opened sometime in September and closed sometime in February, we had over 900 applicants with more people still coming in. The commitment that we have from the county, I believe is about 250K, and the commitment that we have from the city of Portland is about 250K. But as these comrades here have mentioned, uh, organizations and nonprofits are bearing the brunt of where government is coming short. And in terms of visibility, I just have to be frank and honest and direct about what visibility actually looks like for someone like me doing this work in a city like Portland. Our building is located at 5633 Southeast Division. If you've driven by that spot, you've probably seen us there a little bit. If you look at our kiosk, when you drive by that spot, you can see where somebody's tried to burn our building down. If you come to behind the building, you can see a second spot where people have tried to burn the building down. We've had events where people have had their cars vandalized. We've had our windows shot out. And we've had our DJs for some of our amazing events also been shot with pellet guns. And so when we talk about visibility, I want to also name the dangers that come with that especially being an organization, as far as I know, the only black, queer, and trans organization doing work for that community and what that actually means for us. And so while I think it's important that we continue to uh, make sure that trans people are visible, I don't want us to miss what the cost of that visibility might actually be for people living at the intersections. And so what I wanted to share uh, more than that it's just that our organization has been around for approximately about four years. And we hope that we can remain a resource for the community for many, 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 many years to come. But what I would like is for folks uh, who are on the commission, commissioners to come to our office and actually see the realities of what it means to be visible for people doing this work. I'm an Oregonian by choice. I came here seven years ago and I don't plan on leaving. And I don't plan on giving up anytime soon and making sure that this is a state that is welcoming to black folks, queer folks, trans folks, disabled folks, migrants, folks fleeing genocide, and all other folks who are looking for a safe place to land and community. The last thing that I want to say before I close out is really for y'all to understand there's a high need right now. Um, where there's a need for housing, where there's a need for access around healthcare, all of those things, those things are amplified by hundreds for folks that are already facing racism or gender discrimination or escaping a DV situation who might be trans masked and those resources don't exist for trans masculine people. And so this Transgender Day of Visibility I just invite you to come see and bear witness to what visibility means for us at our organization. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Wow. Um, and now, uh, 
I'm not sure who is going to be reading the proclamation, but it is going to be a group effort. Group of two. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Um, yes, we will be all reading them and maybe first we can introduce ourselves. I'm Claire Barrera, I use they, them pronouns. I'm a Multnomah County employee with the Domestic and Sexual Violence Coordination Office. Uh, my name is Gabriel Hernandez, I use they, them pronouns. I am in PRISM leadership and I also work for the Office of Emergency Management. My name is Rosa Garcia, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I identify as fat, queer, Mexican, previously undocumented, and I am the ERG Governance Coordinator with the Office of Diversity and Equity. Um, so today we will be reading <coughs> before the Board of Commission County Commissioners for Multnomah County, Oregon, a proclamation proclaiming March 31st, 2024, excuse me, <coughs> as Transgender Day of Visibility in Multnomah County, Oregon. The Multnomah, Multnomah County, I think you have to read the first one. Okay. It's catching my throat. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners <laughs> finds, A, March 31st marks International Transgender Day of Visibility, a day of celebration and elevation of the voices and contributions of our gender expansive community of transgender, two-spirit, non-binary, genderqueer, gender expansive, gender non-conforming, gender fluid, agender, and <coughs> intersex people, among others here in Multnomah County and around the world. This day is dedicated to celebrating the accomplishments and victories of our gender expansive community and creating a mom moment of visibility in order to raise awareness of the discrimination and violence transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming individuals experience globally and to inspire action and end anti transgender violence and achieve lived equality for all. You're so sweet. Members of the gender expansive community of Multnomah County actively engage in every aspect of life in our community, <clears throat> yet continue to face discrimination, harassment, and violence at rates much higher than cisgender community members. We recognize that these levels of hate and violence disproportionately affect trans femme individuals, particularly those who are black, <clears throat> Latinx, Indigenous, Asian, Pacific Islander, and other trans femmes of color, especially trans femme sex workers of color. We recognize that trans and gender expansive people are valuable members of our community, deserving of the same freedoms and protections as any other, as well as special accommodations to empower and preserve their way of life and honor their uni unique perspectives. United States has a long history of anti-transgender violence and discrimination. While open hatred and intentional targeting of transgender community is on the rise across the nation, the American Civil Liberties Union and other advocacy organizations are tracking record-breaking numbers of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation year after year, including several here in the state of Oregon. HB 4037, HB 4054, and HB 4143 seek to restrict the rights of transgender individuals to use the bathroom, receive gender-affirming health care, receive life, sorry, uh, receive appropriate accommodations within public institutions and participate in regular life activities that all people should be allowed to enjoy. These bills would criminalize the very existence of transgender and non-binary individuals, their family members and healthcare providers seeking to provide gender affirming care for their patients. We must make no mistake, these efforts and others like them pose an active threat to the life and safety of transgender and non-binary individuals by aiming to eliminate their presence in our communities. <clears throat> Youth in Multnomah County are still living in fear of isolation and violence. Transgender and non-binary youth continue to report that they have been verbally or physically harmed due to their identity. Locally and throughout the US, trans-inclusive schools are under attack. Gender affirming teachers, curricula, and policies that are vital to the safety and well being of transgender and non binary students are being systema systematically dismantled. Trans students have been targeted, assaulted, and even killed merely for attempting to use the restroom. 
Multnomah County and the Office of Diversity and Equity are committed to honoring the contributions of our gender expansive employees and supporting the organizations <coughs> that work tire tirelessly as we strive for a workplace that fosters safety, thank you, <laughs> trust and belonging. As we inclusively lead with race, we recognize that institutional racism, oh sorry, we recognize that our BIPOC gender expansive employees face unique multiple barriers due to work due to institutional racism and transphobia. We recognize that trans visibility in the workplace and beyond is vital to shaping the narrative that gender expansive individuals can be their authentic selves and thrive. Multnomah County calls for an end to the persecution, oppression, and targeted annihilation of all marginalized people, both here and abroad, including the act of genocide happening in Gaza and Palestine. We oppose any group in power that enacts or condones state-sanctioned violence against subjugated people with intent to eradicate their lives and destroy their cultural identity. As individuals and systems, we must do everything in our power to name and resist this violence. Multnomah County is committed to fighting against this type of discrimination and supporting all members of our community. We also recognize that our progressive policies and speaking out against anti-transgender legislation and rhetoric do not make us impervious to the inequities caused by hate and oppression. Multnomah County will continue to translate our values into action, <clears throat> lifting up and prioritizing the needs of our gender expansive community as we seek to ensure every community member has access to the services and resources they need in order to live and thrive. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners proclaims March 31st, 2024 as Transgender Day of Visibility in Multnomah County, Oregon. And with this proclamation affirms the commitment to support our gender expansive community. Thank you so much. Commissioner Meyer, and if there is nothing else, oh, we'll go to board comments. Yes, that's that is the presentation. All right, thank you all. We'll go. Well, if you would like to do yours last, since this is your proclamation, we'll start with Commissioner Breeson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for <clears throat> uh, being here today. <clears throat> I was about two credits shy from being a history minor, so I always like to bring history into the room when I can uh, and recognize a former Oregonian, Dr. Alan Hart, uh, who was born female presenting in 1890. Uh, Albert, or Alan made his way to Oregon and graduated from my alma mater, Lewis and Clark College in 1912. Five years later, uh, became the highest um, recognized, uh, at that time, woman graduate of OHSU in 1917. Later that year, uh, Alan convinced a doctor using eugenics arguments uh, to get a hysterectomy, which I think only proves that trans folks have had to fight for the medical care that they deserve using all the tools in the toolbox. Uh, then Alan began to live as a man and had the most amazing career as a doctor and radiologist and wrote four novels. I think that the visibility of trans folks is so incredibly important um, because it shows uh, that the political project to erase trans people in this country and across the globe uh, is relatively recent because we have cultures that have for thousands of years recognized the important role that trans folks play in our culture and the fact that they are welcome, that they are natural, and that they bring all their gifts to bear on society. So I just want to appreciate all the work um, that you all do on behalf of the county, all the work that you do to make uh, trans lives more visible and matter in this community and recognize that there is a cost and a burden to that um, and appreciate um, that continued commitment um, to do uh, what's necessary to move us forward. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brown Edwards. I want to th thank the presenters. We see you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Beeson, uh, for bringing the history in, uh, to life um, in, at the dais. And Commissioner Myron, thank you for bringing this forward today. Thank you so much. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, this, this is just such, um, a, a powerful presentation, uh, today, it, it always is, um, but this, it was just incredible, uh, here, you know, we, we celebrate 
the lives of transgender people calling out a, their basic human right to live authentically while still acknowledging that due to discrimination, the threat of real harm, as we've heard today, not every trans person can or wants to be visible at this time. Every year this proclamation comes forward, we have the opportunity in this room to understand just a little bit more, um, to be able to reflect, to be inspired, to learn, to grow. But most importantly, what, what I loved that Junix said um, was that we create a space for visibility so that trans people can recognize themselves in the world. Um, and that is what is so important. Every, every action that we take, the proclamations that we do, um, when sometimes we think, why, what does a proclamation do? And that is what it can do. Um, Ophelia Junix and, and Zabi, uh, those, those stories um, and the insights that you shared were incredibly powerful. Um, ranging from why it is so important to be visible in a world that is so full of isolation, um, recognizing the intersectionality of all of our lives and what we do and that the global is indeed the local and vice versa. Understanding the real harm and dangers that come with visibility. Um, in seeing the light and the beauty and so much uh, of the spirit and energy and um, contributions of so many people here today and people in the trans community, we also have to acknowledge the, the harm, that need to constantly be combating discrimination, prejudice, marginalizations, violence, and murder against our transgender community, and the self-harm and suicide brought about by all of these actions for th by those who hate and bully and harm. <coughs> I, from, the, from those challenges that are experienced here by people in our workforce, by people sitting in our audience today, by people listening in, by the millions who aren't <laughs> anywhere near us, um, we have to be fighting for secure housing, for access to health care, including gender affirming care, safety in our education systems, and breaking through to end the heartbreaking rates of violence and suicide, especially experienced by transgender youth. Um, we have to be doing all of this work. And when I think of the harm, I can't help but take a moment to pause and reflect on Next Benedict. That, um, how, how alone and harmed they, they felt, but seeing here and hoping that others recognize that they are not alone um, and, that, and that their lives um, matter and are so important and we need to do everything to support them and they can come through. This is my last year on the board, so Today's pro proclamation does take on special meaning for me, and I have to acknowledge I might freak out one of my kids that's here today. Um, I have two non-binary kids. Um, one is in the audience with their friend. I will try not to look specifically <laughs> at them. Um, one really wanted to be here, but is at school, uh, is in college learning, studying to be a teacher, uh, and Whenever I talk to them about teaching, they talk about what they are going to do to um, bring, expand understanding, and intentionally focus on 
queer and gender inclusivity in the classrooms to make kids feel safe. Um, and I'm just so grateful to my kids for everything that they have taught me, for the, how they show up in the world. And as a parent, the most I've hoped for and continue to hope for is that they can live authentically and be safe. As a county commissioner, my job is to strive for a world where everyone's kids, where all people can live authentically and be safe. That is the role that, the sacred role really that we have here on this commission. And so I am so grateful to all of you for being here today and for all you do in a work here in the community and for elevating your voices and being visible. It matters and um, I'm just grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. Um, I wanna thank all of today's presenters for being here to help us honor Trans Day of Visibility, um, our transgender and gender non-conforming people and their lives and experiences. So um, Ophelia, Junix, um, Zuby, thank you so much. Thank you for all of you who were reading the proclamation. That was really wonderful. We've had that um, group readings and a couple times lately and it's been really powerful. Um, your participation today, your being here, being visible, being a part of this is, is incredibly powerful and meaningful and we're really grateful for it. Um, I also want to appreciate Commissioner Myron and your staff for being um, such incredible leaders and allies um, in the transgender and gender nonconforming awareness and visibility and for leading this work. Um, the, this proclamation, this time that we spend in the board recognizing this will is going to continue, but I appreciate your leadership um, in all the time you've been here on this issue. You know, we know that, um, as Commissioner Beeson said, um, uh, transgender and gender nonconforming people have been here since the beginning of time, since there were people. And having a chance to make space today in our community, in our culture, in our society, to um, elevate the visibility, to elevate the contributions that are taking place today, and seek um, and work as much as we can to make spaces where people feel safe, can bring their authentic selves um, into our community so that we all have the benefit of their gifts, their presence, their wholeness, their entire beings. Um, that's the work that we do. It's one of our core values at Multnomah County um, of inclusiveness, of creating that space. Um, we saw that represented last week in some of the um, workforce equity strategic plan renewal process and some of the um, components of that um, so that we are trying to build systems and um, and build those places that outlast any one person but um, create that space um, here in Multnomah County. Um, we know across the United States, we see politicians using trans and gender non-confirming communities as political props in ways that not only damages the fabric of our society, but decreases the safety and support that those communities deserve. And when a politician or a community passes policies that devalue and dehumanize transgender people, limit or remove their basic rights or otherwise discriminate against them, it causes harm to mental health, to a sense of belonging, too often through acts of physical violence that are the result, and it damages all of us as a community. The harms, um, that harm we know impacts young people who are just beginning to explore their identities, and they should be assured by all of us that they'll have access to safe spaces to explore and find support and community. I believe that our community can and should provide safe spaces for gender and identity exploration and value the ways that Multnomah County has and will continue to make that possible because that's what Trans Day of Visibility is all about. So I'm incredibly grateful for the work, contributions, and perseverance of our trans and gender nonconforming community members and allies, and I am dedicated to working in partnership alongside you to ensure that Multnomah County um, can be a safe place, can remain a safe place and community where every one of us can thrive in our truest selves. So I wanna thank all of you for being here today for all your direct contributions to this work. Um, we are gonna have a vote and then we'll do a brief recess so that we can take a photo um, and then we'll move on to the rest of our agenda. So um, uh, Marina, can we please have a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Beeson? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Brim Edwards? I hate going after Commissioner Beeson. Aye. <laughs> I, I. Chair Vega Peterson. I was already just gonna say the proclamation is adopted. I wasn't even gonna vote. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the proclamation is adopted.
All right, we will recess for about five minutes to take a photo.
All right. Uh, good morning again, everyone. We are reconvening, and we are now going to move on to R2 for an update uh, from Unified Command and the Health Department. This is a non-voting item. Um, what we will have the presenters provide support. So if we can have those um, come down to the dais. I am I'm really glad that today we're going to be doing a health focus update on our 90 day fentanyl. Fenton, our, our I'm just, just going to read it into the record real quick. Uh, just our, our two update from Unified Command and the Health Department. Okay, thank you so much for reading it into the record. Um, so we've had some updates on our um, 90 day fentanyl emergency. Having the Health Department with us today is going to give us the opportunity to update you not only on our upcoming public awareness campaign, but to reflect upon a lot of the most successful community engagement in the past few weeks, which has included a town hall at KATU and a health department sponsored half day summit last week. Um, the feedback we're hearing from people the most to this work, most close to this work is that it's been successful, it's going well. Outreach providers are speaking up to say this 90 day emergency and focus has helped them to do their work. Um, they are making connections in ways that they have never before and moving people more successfully from a tent to shelter to an on-ramp to treatment. This is happening in places like the Clinton Triangle Temporary Alternative Shelter Site, where through collaboration and partnership, more people seeking recovery in the central city now have access to shelter and treatment through Recovery Works Northwest. This is also happening where outreach workers from the Mental Health and Addictions Association of Oregon travel on foot from the north side of Old Town and work their way south to the Behavioral Health Resource Center, interacting with 200 to 300 people each day, either at their outreach van or on the streets. These are outreach workers like Brian Cooper and Rico Mieja, who both have firsthand knowledge of life on the streets and are working those streets to create a pipeline with real life connections. This is happening on the morning calls where outreach workers and first responders talk through how to support each other and target the outreach to focus on getting people the help who need it the most. As much as this emergency is helping us see to see what's working, it's also exposing our gaps and helping us see what we need more of. For instance, how do we stand up a more complete and robust nighttime response in the same areas of town where Unified Command is having success during the day? because that's what this period of intense trial and error is about. It's about understanding the deepest and most pressing needs and collaboratively working to address them. We can also celebrate many things that we're not doing as much as we used to, including duplication of policy efforts, oversaturation in certain geographic areas to focus on trust building and fewer silos in our work. We are stronger than the sum of our parts. We're working better together than we have ever before at building trust and safety. We're understanding our resources and our gaps better today than we did on January 30th, and we're making progress. That progress includes medium <clears throat> and longer term recommendations that will be part of our 90 day transition plan, which is already being drafted. Every day, discussion turns to how we're going to hand off this emergency in order to make long lasting, sustainable, and geographically um, dispersed results. That started to come into focus, especially more directly around how Multnomah County will take what's being learned today into tomorrow's countywide response. Before we begin today's presentation, I also want to take a moment to thank Emergency Management Director Chris Foss for helping us fill a gap at Unified Command while Dr. Jennifer Vines um, is on leave for the next couple of weeks. Thanks to Dr. Vines and Chris for your outstanding commitment and leadership. And with that, I am happy to turn to Multnomah County Agency Administrator, Abby Stamp, and the members of our health department to begin today's briefing. Good morning. Good morning, thank you, Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Abby Stamp. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Executive Director of the Multnomah County Local Public Safety Coordinating Council, and I'm here today as the Agency Administrator for Multnomah County. I will be very quick today. Um, I would love to give my health department colleagues um, all of the rest of the time on the agenda today, and you will note my slide presentation represents the Unified Command, the, the Incident Management Team, and the, the logoed and branded uh, presentation, and then it's a completely separate slide deck to have our health partners really talk about the countywide work. Um, thank you so much for partnering with me today. Next slide, please. Um, my job today is to go over the three areas that I think are most important to do some quick updates. And I wanted to also thank the commission for the opportunity to continue to meet with you one-on-one -on -one as this work changes daily. And I also want to acknowledge that because we are required to submit slide decks um, so much ahead of time, which is fantastic, it's also very hard when you're working on a project that changes day to day. Uh, next slide, please. I want to remind folks of the um, five objectives of the incident management team in our unified command. So leverage the city, state, and county's 
resources to improve livability in Portland City Center, to enhance coordination and accessibility of housing treatment and recovery services in Portland, combine health law enforcement and other data into a countywide dashboard for better response and monitoring, identify housing, health, and law enforcement gaps and obstacles, and make specific policy recommendations to leaders and lawmakers for federal coordination, and finally, develop a transition plan. Next slide, please. So treatment uh, and engagement has been the primary focus. Uh, the chair already mentioned some of the successes that the 0800 Rapid Response Assessment Task Force is experiencing and also some of the challenges. I will share that last night I was um, here working on the Justice Fellowship until about 8.30 and made sure to take a very slow and meandering route home um, to drive through downtown to get a sense of what the later hours look like. Um, and yes, we are having lots of successes during the day and we also know we need to continue to work in the nighttime, evening hours, on the weekends, um, and different spots that are, are continuing to challenge um, some of our coordination efforts. And the Un Unified Commanders are working every day to identify ways to fill those gaps. The, um, so the summit, which I'll have our health department um, members talk about, was incredibly successful. It was a beautiful day um, and a way to build on past experiences. And we certainly hope to continue to facilitate the connection of providers and others working um, against this incredible challenge. Data. Our data team continues to meet um, every every single uh, week, couple times a week, and tracking the incident management team's activities and is finalizing a dashboard. So I wanted to announce today that on Monday, the 25th of March, a dashboard will be launched and housed on the Multnomah County's Fentanyl um, Emergency website. And many thanks to all of the data analysts who've been working tirelessly <laughs> to get this up and running. And that data will include med medical examiner death data, emergency department in urgent uh, care fentanyl related visits, a BOIC or the Bureau of Emergency Management, uh, sorry, Bureau's, Bureau of Emergency Communications was 911, ambulance data as well as Portland Fire and Rescue. I also wanted to highlight some of the successes that you will see in the situation status report, which is posted uh, weekly to the Multnomah County webpage as well. You will see increases week over week. Um, the number of fentanyl uh, grams seized uh, by law enforcement, another of arrests by uh, for delivery, the number of contacts for BHRC, BHRC, Behavioral Health Resource Center, and other outreach staff, uh, the number of overdose reversals and substance use treatment referrals continue to climb. Always a work in progress and always wanting to refine, but we note the importance of sharing and being transparent about these processes as they emerge week over week. Um, and finally, our policy team is fully staffed and working on two areas. One, our shorter term, perhaps during 90 days, perhaps later, some of those challenges where operationalization has been a, uh, an issue to figure out ways to bust through barriers that have been challenges for work that has been planned for a very long time and also continuing to collect the challenges and observations that need work past 90 days and into the next year and probably the next decade. Many challenges with many Medicaid, big funding challenges, um, supporting substance use disorder provider continua, um, staffing issues, many things that the 90 days effort really has galvanized. Last slide is a reminder about me and I'll continue to stay in touch regularly, Madam Chair, with you and commissioners one-on-one -on -one, and I will continue to uh, return to the dais um, twice a month to continue to provide updates. And with that, I would love to hand the baton to my colleagues at the Health Department. Can, can I just ask a brief question? So the, the presentation that was loaded in, is it a complete, re, re, what we have now, is it a complete re, replacement that was sent this morning versus what was sent? I submitted? don't know what was sent this morning, Matt. I don't know what was sent, um, but on the website there are two presentations. Okay. So there's the one with the, the brands of the three levels of government, um, city, county, state, and then the next one, which is already on the slide deck here, which is the health department portion. Right. So just two separate presentations. All right. Uh, good morning, Chair Vega Peterson, Commissioner Myron, Commissioner Beeson, Commissioner Brim Edwards. For the record, my name is Rachel Banks. I use she, hers. I am the director of the health department. I am so pleased to be here today with Diego and Emily, who will introduce themselves um, as we move more fully into the presentation. Next slide. So um, in past meetings and, and briefings, you recall the health department has been here talking about really an overall comprehensive long-term um, plan to overdose 
prevention and response. And today we're gonna talk about a couple of the core functions there, um, but just as a reminder, that plan includes prevention of initiation, reducing harms associated with drug use, um, increasing access to treatment, and recovery and ultimately thriving communities as people are um, in recovery. And today we're gonna be talking about a couple of those competency areas. So Diego will be providing an overview of the health communication campaigns. Um, and Emily, Dr. Mosaitis will be providing an uh, update on health data. I'll also wrap with just sharing some overall themes from the fentanyl summit. Um, and of course, happy to take any questions. I just wanna note as we're, um, you know, I always appreciate working in the health department with the breadth uh, of, of interventions and strategies we use, really that head, heart, and guts, but also um, always as we're talking about data, just understanding the impact that that has on real people's lives and um, and and just this, we're, we're really ranging between a campaign around hope and resilience and recovery and also talking about some really hard topics. So just wanna acknowledge the, the um, real and personal impacts um, of the, the work and the breadth of what we're talking about today. With that, I'll hand it over to Diego. Thanks, Come Rachel. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> For the record, my name is Diego Wasabe. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the communications and marketing team manager for the health department. Um, and I'm here to give a brief update on some of our planned health communications campaigns as they relate to our overdose response and prevention. Um, the first campaign, which we'll go more in depth today, is a campaign titled Recovery is Possible. The goal of this campaign is to promote recovery, connect folks to resources. It's really an uplifting campaign. Um, the second campaign that we're working on, and all these will launch in the next month and a half, is a youth-focused educational campaign, really to raise awareness of the risks of fentanyl, um, to provide resources for primary and secondary prevention, such as reversing an overdose, and We've completed four focus groups for that campaign. We have two more to go before it launches. And one thing I wanted to highlight is really the importance of painting a local landscape and focusing not just the assets, but the stories we're telling and the marketing approach locally here to Multnomah County. So grounding it in reality, making sure that the resources that we provide and the assets that we create speak directly to our residents and to our youth in particular. The third campaign, that we're working on is a website, kind of an addiction and recovery information website. We know that this topic carries a lot of stigma, and really this website, the goal is to explain the science and health condition of addiction, and also provide resources how to help somebody with an addiction, and ultimately to bust some of these myths and eliminate some of the stigma that we know um, prevents folks from seeking treatment. So those are the three main efforts that we're focused on. Next slide, please. The goals of Recovery is Possible is a campaign, one, to motivate people who may be ready to step into treatment and recovery, hopefully to um, make folks more sober curious. The second goal is really to encourage those folks actively in recovery, to show that we support them, to show that we celebrate their successes. The third goal would be to lower the stigma of seeking help for addiction. Um, I think as I mentioned, you know, studies show that a lot of folks don't seek support because of the stigma, social stigma and judgment that comes with seeking that support. And then the fourth goal of the campaign is really to provide hope and encouragement to everybody else in our community. We know that one in five Oregonians struggle with substance use disorder. We know that even more folks are impacted or know somebody that is struggling. So we also know that that recovery is happening every day all around us in Multnomah County and we wanna share those stories, we wanna amplify that hope and we wanna make sure that people know where to turn to that they can get the support that they need. Next slide, please. So Recovery is Possible launches with physical placements around Multnomah County. Um, the campaign will run from March 18th to September 1st. There will be a total of nine major billboards. Those are gonna be on um, freeways like 84, 205, I-5, as well as 34 arterial billboards. That just means they're on major streets like Burnside across the county. Um, the placements of these were informed by 911 overdose calls um, by zip code. So we wanted to make sure that we had these placements in areas where we see that there's a discrepancy of calls for overdoses. Um, 
And what I'll mention is this campaign launches with these physical placements, but it also will have a digital component that comes after this, which will be, again, more focused locally, um, soliciting testimonials of recovery from real people in Multnomah County that can offer advice, tell their story, find ways to connect um, with those folks in recovery to encourage more folks to step up and seek the, the support that they need. Next slide, please. These are some examples of the campaign. And actually, I think this is one of the slides that had a correction. I apologize for that. When we submitted it two weeks ago, that camping trip made possible by recovery, that's an asset that isn't launching initially for us. That one is slated to launch down the road. We have one that is um, hiking pals made possible by recovery. It's a separate asset we, we sent that didn't make it in this presentation. But these are the two major bulletins that you'll see. And then next slide, please. These are some examples of the arterial posters which will launch as well. Again, um, this will continue to shift to a digital medium where we will have video testimonials of folks in recovery offering advice, sharing their story, um, and inspiring others to hopefully follow suit. But we really hope folks engage with this campaign, see these billboards, have more supportive, non-judgmental conversations, and we welcome everybody to tell their story of recovery, share that with us so we can continue to uplift our community with their own voices. And with that, I'll pass it along to my colleague, Emily. Thank you. For the record, my name is Emily Masaitis. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the epidemiology manager for the Community Epidemiology Services team at Multnomah County Health Department. Chair and commissioners, it's good to meet you. I'm gonna talk about quantitative health data related to fentanyl. These data can create an important picture of the fentanyl crisis but this picture is less like one you take with your phone and more like one that's an old school photograph that takes time to develop. So with my time here, I wanna uh, do three things. I want to share um, the context around what that data development looks like. I'll share the actions that we are taking at the health department and I'll provide two data visualizations related to fentanyl overdose. Here on this slide, you can see three types of data related to fentanyl. An, Im an important thing to know about each of these is that there's a different organization or a set of organizations that collects and maintains these types of data. The first here is epidemiology data. This tells us the health outcomes related to fentanyl, and the most salient example of this is overdose data. Fatal overdose data come from vital statistics and from medical examiners' uh, investigations, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, data on treatment use and access are also p important pieces of information related to healthcare services uh, for substance use disorder. The source for these data tends to be healthcare organizations themselves. And finally, related to way that the emergency response works, there are data that track activities in the response, like what's happening with outreach, treatment initiation, naloxone distribution. These pieces of data are each collected and maintained by the various organizations that are active in the response. Next slide, please. All of these pieces of data tend to take longer to develop than we might expect. This slide shows some of the process required to gather the data. For data that have not been collected before, this can take years of analytic work. For even for data that are further along in this process, it might not be in the most useful form, and a skilled analyst has to go back to make modifications and go through the process again. When we're talking about something as serious and sensitive as lives lost to overdose, the protections that need to be in place and the community engagement interpre and interpretation that needs to happen are critical and they also take time. So this data differs from data that are less sensitive and, and serious. Next slide. But we are moving these processes forward for several pieces of data related to fentanyl. Our team has ongoing work where we've increased activity like analyzing fatal and non-fatal overdose trends, mapping fatal overdoses, tracking substance use treatment um, for county services and also county funded organizations. We're doing additional work um, specifically in, in support of the response. We are convening agencies to host an overdose data dashboard that was mentioned that is coming very soon. Um, and we're also supporting response activity tracking. Next slide. I'm going to share some data that we have on fatal overdose, but first I want to explain why it's easier to show data on fatal overdose compared to non-fatal overdose. 
On the left side of the slide here, we can see that the data on, or we can see how data on non-fetal overdose are recorded. There has to be an organization present to record data on a non-fetal overdose. So this comes in through medical touch points. The data are not in a single location. They're hosted by multiple agencies and it would take concerted time and effort to join these data sets together. We also know from surveys that about half of non-fetal overdoses may be reversed by bystanders who don't call 911. Fatal overdoses, on the other hand, are investigated by the medical examiner's office and after they are confirmed, they're recorded as death certificates in vital statistics, which is a single data source that our team has access to. However, it takes a long time, about three to four months, to finalize and confirm overdose deaths. I'm able to share two visualizations on fatal overdose now. Next slide. This graph shows the number of confirmed fentanyl-related overdose deaths each month over the past five years. The red line shows the cumulative number of deaths over time. Because it takes time to confirm, the data from 2023 are not yet complete, which is why it looks like there's a decrease at the end of 2023. Those numbers are being finalized now. I want to take a moment and acknowledge that this is not just a graph. Um, this is a representation of over 860 people, community members, loved ones, who have lost their lives to fentanyl overdose. In 2023, it was more than one person per day. And if you know someone in these data, this can be hard to look at. It shows us the direction that we do not want to keep going. Next slide. This map shows us a different way to view fatal fentanyl-related overdoses in the past five years. Overdoses occurred across the county, uh, but the red hexagons in the middle of this map represent statistically significant clusters of overdose. That means that more overdoses occurred there than expected by random chance. This is the downtown Portland area. More recent data on fatal and non-fetal overdoses will be available very soon as the data that we've been developing over time come to the end of the process that I showed earlier. We look forward to providing that data to you all uh, and to the public to help guide our way through this fentanyl crisis. Thank you very much for your time. I will hand it back to Rachel. Thank you. So uh, last week, as was mentioned, we hosted a fentanyl summit, over a 50, 150 um, providers, peers, uh, community-based organizations came together to really do a couple of things. Identify um, direct pathways into existing clinical addiction treatment services and really providing insight um, on those pathway options, understanding that, not, not, that one size is not going to fit all. Um, there were a number of themes that came out of that um, through a really engaging um, agenda that included building off of past summits, um, Attorney General Rosenblum was there, as well as the Portland area, in Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board talking about their summit, as well as um, Oregon Health Authority's Behavioral Health Director, Ebony Clark. And so starting with that grounding and what had been done, um, and then moving into a series of interactive conversations with 10 breakout groups that covered the range of things that I talked about earlier, including prevention, harm reduction, treatment recovery, um, medically assisted treatment, so on and so forth. And the themes that came out of that were, um, A, there was there's a need for connection, communication, convening, and collaboration, and for folks to get together to solve this very complex issue um, that is necessary but not sufficient. So there's a focus on, yes, we need to be connecting, but really moving towards action. There was an identification, there's a couple of different activities that included mapping of where services are happening, um, and there's the, the the need was identified for a single place to a single database, if you will, to understand what services uh, are out there, which would help escalate those referral pathways. And that based on the, the data and the needs in our community, that there is more of a need for culturally and linguistically specific, appropriate, and responsive services. Um, in the coming weeks, there will be a full report that we'll release about the summit and all of the themes uh, and all of the findings. We were taking diligent notes, um, so more to come with that. And with that, we're happy to um, take questions or comments.
Thank you, Rachel. Thank all of you for um, the presentation and the uh, briefing today. Um, I will just say, I know Ryan Gamba has sent out some of the materials that came out of the fentanyl summit, you know, and some of the other materials on this, and um, really appreciate the work that is going on and encourage the board to review those if I haven't had a chance, if they haven't had a chance already. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, start with um, any board questions for our panel. We'll start with you, Commissioner Burm Edwards. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm interested in um, the link between our communications, the education campaign, and actually what's available, um, and how we're thinking about addressing the issue of if we encourage people uh, to seek treatment and the benefits of recovery, um, but we don't have actually adequate uh, treatment or access to it, how are we bridging that? Like we're getting people to say, yes, I'm, I, want, I want treatment, I, I want to say yes to recovery. Um, how are we building that bridge and the, cap the capacity so that um, when somebody's ready that we actually have the ability to pro provide that service? I can speak to the communications part of it. So, for example, for recovery as possible, the two calls to action that we incur in the campaign is to call Lines for Life and also to um, visit Recovery Network of Oregon's website or their new app to find culturally specific services that are located near them. Um, and there's a lot of analytics that go on in terms of measuring how many calls are getting, how many hits are coming on the website, how many people are interested. Is there an increase in the demand and what does that look like in terms of making sure that those treatments are available? Um, I'm not sure that I can speak to that from the communications perspective, but I know it's something that was addressed in the summit. And as Rachel mentioned, having that repository of what's available um, mapped, you know, what is closest, where are the available beds, and having more coordination across all these organizations to make sure that we have a better kind of broad view of what's available and we can get folks the support that they're looking to get. Yeah, no, I thank you uh, for that and, and the question, Commissioner Brim Edwards. I think it's both us playing the short and long game at the same time and working on that both hand. We know that we absolutely need to be building um, more treatment and recovery options. We know that we want to see every bed filled and so the coordination and making sure that people can get there when they're ready is important. And we also know that over time we need to be increasing the um, amount of folks who will, as we're building those additional services, um, want to utilize them, but also decrease the stigma and humanize and create hope. Um, I think that you know that, that this was evident to me in this in this presentation that we're both talking about hope and like people's lives and I think there's so much um, that people are hearing about what's not working and, and so uh, so a piece of it is really reducing that stigma and, and creating that hope that even with something like fentanyl which there's so much information about just how um, powerful and deadly it is that there is hope that people can recover um, and that takes time to build that confidence through communication campaigns that takes time to build towards behavior change. So we want to start that on ramp while we're also building the um, the other services and, and really doing that both end uh, approach. I fully anticipate that you know over the the course of that there will be you know the the supply and demand will ebb and flow. But but we're wanting to make sure that um, that piece is there for long term behavior change. So as the campaign launches um, and plays out, I'd really like to see the data of how many people actually take those two um, actions, and then I'd like to see our plan that matches um, when people call and are looking for it, that they actually get treatment, because um, I think nothing kills hope like not actually being able to, to um, receive the service. So for me, a really fundamental piece would be we can have an amazing campaign, um, and we can get people to take that action, but if we don't have a plan to actually have treatment accessible, um, then I think we there's a huge missing gap in um, whether we're going to be successful here. And another question just related to um, sort of building the campaign around hope and treatment. Um, do, do we, as a county, does the health department have a point of view on there being effective um, treatment for fentanyl addiction? 
Yeah, we do, and I think that those are conversations too that were happening in the summit and with providers across the um, county and community. I know we it'll need multiple different treatment options, of course, yes, for fentanyl, but also as we know from our data that there's polysubstance use, um, and I think that's a piece of it, having the clinical confidence and understanding for medic medication-supported recovery, that that information translates to folks, um, you know, who are um, using that there's also hope and, and, and both of those pieces um, we, you know, certainly have um, physicians that can speak to and have, have all sorts of thoughts in terms of different sort of treatments for different, um, you know, drugs and, and some of that. But we definitely have that perspective and that's something can, can follow up on more specifically, but really need a range of treatment options um, and, and including polysubstance use options. The reason I ask is just my work around the plan and design for um, the sobering center um, often we've heard is there's not an effective treatment um, specifically for fentanyl and so I'm I would like to have a follow-up and just um, from the point of view of the health department what are um, what is the health department saying is the effective treatment for fentanyl specific addiction and I don't need it right now but I'd like to have that um, and then uh, this is a question, maybe it's when the data dashboard is coming out on Monday, is that right? Um, so um, the communication campaign was somewhat built around the 911 calls on overdoses and the zip codes. It, will that be available on the dashboard? So I don't need to ask for it today, I can just look on the dash. Like I would be able to look at the dashboard and be able to see by zip code the ones that were recorded, I understand. Um, that Half of them, it sounds like, aren't, aren't recorded, um, but that, that's available? Uh, that's right. So um, there are five data sources in the current iteration of the dashboard. It is, uh, it's a dashboard that will be iterative, so the, the version that will be able to be available publicly on Monday will have those five sources, and two of them currently have zip code data. It's actually ambulance, ambulance specific data, uh, the 911 data uh, will not in this iteration have zip code data, but it could in the future. So ambulance data and emergency department uh, data on residents will be available by zip code on the dashboard. Great, and then just uh, one last question. I really am looking forward to looking at, at the data and specifically um, just the impacts on East Portland. And there, there was a slide in here that it's in the fentanyl deaths, which um, that's a pretty shocking graph, even though it's incomplete. Um, so I'm glad we're uh, taking action. And um, I'm gonna continue my theme of looking at East Portland, um, not in addition to downtown. And there's, uh, let's see, this doesn't have a slide on it, but it's the slide that t is titled Confirmed Fentanyl Related Overdose Deaths, and there's the concentration it looks like in um, downtown. It said that the deaths, between 2018 and 2023 are clustered significantly in downtown. Um, if this is a pretty high level map, so you can't really tell the difference between downtown and East Portland. Is it possible to also get that data or will that be by zip code as well? Again, um, I am continuing to hear um, from neighbors and community members um, in mid to East, East Portland, um, just about the continuing problem and, um, you know, lives being ruined every day out there. And so I'd like to look at that more specifically and then also understand as we um, march through the 90 days um, how the strategies are going to be scaled and replicated as we move east. You. And I'm, I just want to say, um, I'm, I'm, I think Dr. Bruno would also be really interested in having a conversation about the medicine, the, from the health department perspective of medicine. We've had some good conversations about that. So, uh, Commissioner Myron. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I guess uh, for, I'll, there were a number of different aspects of this presented here. So I'll try to break my comments down into sections or my questions and starting with the objectives and I I guess the 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 first objective is to improve livability in downtown um, if I was addicted or had a loved one who had died of an overdose the idea that the first objective 
on our fentanyl 90 day emergency is to quote, improve livability in Portland city center, unquote, is, seems outrageous. Um, and so I am curious how that language was arrived at and I would suggest that that be changed if possible because it seems like it could also, it could almost be hurtful to people. Those objectives were developed by the seven unified commanders from the city and county and state uh, when the emergency was first declared. Um, and because the unified commanders needed to take the three emergency declarations that were voted on and approved by the county and the city and the state, um, this is what they believed had the most global representation of all of those three levels of interest and an ability to look at both um, short-term treatment and engagement, making sure we have data, and also the longer term. But I, I hear you, and I can take those concerns and comments of yours, Commissioner, back to the unified commanders. I would, I would very much appreciate that it really struck me um, and I think the other objectives are are vague probably for the reasons you described that um, they're taking things from three different uh, declarations of emergency um, and so I'm still uh, not sure what the goal is for the night the emergency declaration perhaps I mean I would suggest something like goals for 90 days, decrease the number of overdoses and fentanyl and deaths from overdoses related to fentanyl, which it looks like you're on the way in that area, but, but other subject. Uh, increase the number of individuals arrested and jailed for distribution of fentanyl. Release a focused ad campaign, increasing awareness about the risks of fentanyl and providing information regarding services. And then at the end of 90 days, present a comprehensive plan to systematize and coordinate efforts to prevent, reduce, harm, treat, provide detox, and foster recovery for substance use disorder. So, um, I mean, that, those would be my suggested objectives. Uh, and I, I wanna note, as I have noted throughout this, that conspicuously absent is any reference to supply side, which is a very important part of this equation. If we're not addressing the supply in any way, then, or at least alluding to it, then it, we're, we're losing the battle before we even start. So I would at least um, acknowledge that. For the ad campaign, I do appreciate that after years of crisis, um, the county is finally attempting to offer some public awareness and education I do feel that it is, I don't, know, I don't know what the word is, I'll say just out of touch. Um, the billboard approach with those photos um, and the message seems in light of the, again, emergency and crisis that we're facing with deaths uh, just skyrocketing, people literally dying on our streets that we're showing some stock photos of some people standing in front of a house that, I mean, maybe they're locals, I don't know, but um, standing in front of a house saying recovery is possible just seems so not connected to the reality of what most people are experiencing, including people who need recovery. And, and then the camping one, I think is downright, I, I have to say, I found that offensive and I was shocked that it made it through some process to get into the approved category. But um, I, I guess how we have leadership, we have a whole um, division of uh, consumer consumers. We have a director of consumer engagement uh, who is incredible and tied into um, all of the peer groups in our community. He has a team in the, e how, was, how was that whole team in particular DeAndre included and did they approve of the advertising campaign? I can speak to that. So <clears throat> we've been meeting with the Office of Consumer Engagement on a weekly basis to review this and future assets. 
To start, I think the, the importance of the message fitting the medium. So on a billboard campaign, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible of everybody suffering from addiction and showing that recovery is possible, not just from fentanyl, but in general, one in five Oregonians suffering from substance use disorder. And that campaign will get more and more specific um, through other mediums that tell more local stories like digital assets, videos that'll be able to feature folks in recovery, giving advice, explaining why they chose recovery and what advice and what message they have to the community. We're actually working with the Office of Consumer Engagement on those specific assets. We had a photo shoot with them, with folks in recovery. So all these campaigns have been informed by folks with lived experience and living experience in recovery. I think that the billboard campaign at large is our broadest stroke, our widest net for Multnomah County residents. And the message that the Multnomah County Health Department is sharing for folks on that broad page is essentially that this is possible. Not only is it possible, recovery is happening all around Multnomah County. And there's these resources in this incredible community of folks like DeAndre and OC that can support folks in recovery. But rest assured, these campaigns will get much more focused, much more culturally specific on other medium that will be able to um, be more storytelling focused and more grounded in kind of the realities that we see here. I will also mention that this campaign came about through our 2024 overdose prevention and response plan, which was kind of a ninth month process of the health department assessing what are the priorities, what do our community partners, what do subject matter experts feel that we need to be doing. And on the communications front, there was two things that jumped out immediately. One was encouraging recovery at large, and two, a youth prevention and awareness campaign specifically about fentanyl. So um, rest assured, Commissioner Meyer, I think the, the campaign assets and the message will get more and more focused and tackle fentanyl in the situation head on. The billboards are more kind of the broad strokes for the county at large, and not just the folks with addiction, but the folks that want to support their loved ones, their friends, their family with this as well. And I, I, appreciate, I appreciate your response, and I, I believe recovery needs to be obviously um, a huge part of messaging. I guess I would just, I, I feel that these billboards aren't it. Um, and it's missing a hugely important element of this, which is the whole reason for a 90 day fentanyl crisis. If we were, you know, for the long term, things are fine, let, you know, like everything's real, let's do happy pictures of recovery. Yes, we, we should message recovery is possible for anyone anywhere, um, but for a fentanyl emergency where we're declaring a crisis and have an educational campaign that is coming out from this emergency crisis response, I guess that, that was the disconnect for me. Um, and I, I do have a question, you referenced youth, which is so uh, essential, I'm just curious why um, What, it sounds like youth are down the line in terms of the youth education campaign. It seems like preventing youth from starting for taking fentanyl seems like it should be front and center and we should be screaming in the schools like, don't start fentanyl. Um, it, yeah, so. Absolutely, that campaign is rolling out at the end of April and we're currently testing it with focus groups. And so I think the idea is we want to make sure we land this message right, the idea of making sure that youth are informing, see themselves, feel themselves in these campaign assets. Um, but yeah, it's paramount that we initiate prevention and also give them resources, not just to youth in that campaign, but also to peers, counselors, parents as a secondary audience that have resources about how do we have these conversations? How can we <coughs> promote those conversations to raise, that to raise that awareness outside of just a curriculum or a campaign? How do we foster those conversations in a way that people feel more comfortable and feel the urgency that you're mentioning to actually address this head on with, with youth? Um, Thanks, I guess I, I just, differences of opinion in the, what I define as emergent and urgent and um, how to go about communicating with, with folks. But I appreciate, I really appreciate your, your explaining that in detail. Um, I had a question in terms of the epidemiology and data. Um, so are overdose deaths tracked in the same way as for other diseases? And that's for Emily, I guess. Sure. Um, like outbreaks, things? Yeah, thanks for that question. I would not describe uh, that overdose fatalities are tracked in the same 
exact way as uh, as outbreaks because the way that the epidemiology works, it tracks within the community in a different way. So we follow, we conduct surveillance for both those type of health outcomes, uh, but for for overdose, the 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 timing of the way that the the trends change is a bit slower than an outbreak. So outbreaks can be explosive and come back down. Uh, these more um, chronic diseases and other um, causes of uh, causes of mortality and things like that, those tend to be on longer timelines and track in a different way. So they are both, we conduct surveillance for both, uh, but they act differently. And so the way that we engage with that data is different. I um, thank you for that. Uh, I guess it does seem like there's some, there have been some explosions of death, like times when there's 11 overdose deaths or whatever that number was, that there, there should be ways of tracking that in real time to, um, to identify whether it's hot spots or if there's something particular going on. Um, but I, I do appreciate what you said. I guess the idea that we don't even have the full data from last year is uh, I, I, I can't get my mind around that. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, and is it, do we have the data available if it was presumed death by overdose? Is that available more quickly? Yeah, absolutely, and thanks for um, drawing that distinction. So the, over, the overdose data dashboard that will become available will also include suspected deaths. Okay. This is much more real time than those confirmed deaths. Uh, there's still a lag because it takes time for investigators, this is the medical examiner's office, for the investigators to uh, fill out a suspected form and enter into the system. So there can be a one to two week lag, even those data are not gonna be complete in real time, but they give us a much more recent view of what's going on. Uh, and our uh, epidemiology team has conducted analysis of the accuracy of that form, and it performs pretty well, capturing uh, you know three quarters ish of the deaths that do actually end up being due to fentanyl. So that's it's a fentanyl specific form. That's that's great. Okay, um, yeah, two weeks is much better than yes. six months or or whatever <laughs> um, when we're trying to address again an emergency or crisis. And Commissioner Ryan, I'm just gonna remind you, we're running out of time for the one, mm -hmm. two, three, four, five other budget um, items that we have. So if you have additional questions, I know Abby's willing to meet weekly and everyone's willing to meet. Yeah, I know. I guess the questions though are ones that I imagine the public would want to hear about as well. Um, they're questions that people raise to me and aren't just my questions. So that's, let yeah. me go. I'll. If you want to read them, we can. More. Okay. I mean, Abby comes back every two weeks, and and we can always get questions answered at, at the next update as well. And again, I mean, and I take issue with the two weeks itself. Again, in a, an emergency, when we have like maybe two more two week sessions to go before the emergency is over. And she's also um, meeting with each of you every single week too. Right. That gets back to the public issue, but. A couple of small, of just brief, I think, questions might be, one one that is being measured is, what is medical discipline? I saw something as listed as medical discipline. What does that mean? Yeah, I asked that question. Thank you, Commissioner um, Abby Stamp again. I asked that question of our um, Joint Information Center to make sure I have a, a, a good definition of that. Um, I want to confirm that before I give a, a clear and public answer, but I will, I'll try to do that before our 4.30 meeting, 4 o'clock meeting today. Okay. Yep. My understanding is it's fentanyl related vaguely, but I want to make sure I have a, a good descriptive definition. Okay, perfect, uh, I guess. Um, and then there's a section in the report that says it will start to include the number of, quote, blocks cleaned, unquote. And again, in a fentanyl emergency, when we, I would be focusing on people's lives, I found this a disturbing turn of phrase, particularly in the livability context, and that being the prime objective of the uh, fentanyl emergency declaration. What does it mean for a block to be cleaned? 
I will share, Commissioner, that it has been a very interesting and uh, eye-opening process to have so many different people from different departments, agencies, and jurisdictions come together to find common goals and common objectives. And it is um, the goal of uh, different Portland departments who are more first responders and uh, caretaking for the quote unquote cleanliness of streets in downtown Portland, and then Multnomah County representing behavioral health connections, outreach, um, and providing a different, there are different, hmm, it's all important and it's very different how those cultures come together to try to seek wellness and seek different goals and objectives. And so I, I tr remember I'm a social worker by training and I see blocks cleaned and I also have a visceral reaction to that, but I also know that that is a value, um, particularly one that was uplifted in many of the uh, conversations that were heard from Portland business communities who wanted to really ensure that they could open their doors and have an environment that they felt like was hospitable to the clients and the customers that were important for their businesses to stay open and afloat and well. So this is from um, PIMO, the Portland Environment Management Office, which is a Portland office specifically in that jurisdiction. And that is a metric that they have chosen to quantify. Okay, I guess um, that seems like something in the, the Central City Task Force or with the, whatever that was supposed to do, like that they could measure that if they want through the City of Portland in a fentanyl emergency crisis declaration. I, some, I don't know why it's here, but the final, um, I guess, uh, to echo um, some of Commissioner Brim Edwards' uh, questions I know that, that she's raised. Are we measuring impacts in any other region of the county, like the impacts of that potential whack-a-mole of, as people are cleaned from downtown and it's more livable downtown, um, are things getting worse and less livable in other parts of the county? Yes. Yes, they are, yes, or yes, they that's are. being tracked? Yes, it is okay. being tracked, is being evaluated, is being constantly and chronically questioned to ensure this is not a game of whack-a-mole and that we are clear that we are making connections to recovery, connections to services, connections to housing for the entire community while there is also a continued focus on the Portland City Center. Okay, and this is literally the final question. It's a, um, so, I'm curious as, you know, given the timing of the release of the Homeless Response Action or Plan with a so-called by name list of 5,400 individuals who are houseless, um, where the function of a by name list is to identify people's issues and so you can you know, address those issues, invest, et cetera. Are we connecting with that so that people that are on that list are being identified in connection with the fentanyl emergency declaration or some of this? so we can get them the services they need proactively? Yes, yes, I reached out to Chris Fick wanting to make some, some connections to ensure all of these big efforts that are happening simultaneously are connected and are aligned and not working at cross purposes and actually um, yes anding each other. So we're gonna figure out what those intersections are and, and Skylar is also a, a key participant on the, the agency administrator team and we are highlighting some of those connections because as you know, Commissioner she's incredibly involved in the housing, housing responses. System. Okay. Um, well, I would love to continue those conversations because uh, there's um, a lot there and I think a lot is being missed in some of the data that I think we report that we're collecting and that we think we're collecting, but might, might not be, but it intersects with the homelessness data, substance use, et cetera. So thank you. Thank Thanks you. for the grace. Commissioner Beeson. Time. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for being here. Um, <clears throat> a few random questions. So um, I, I read that book, Nudge, and then I read that book, Scarcity, and recognizing that the behavioral psychology of folks um, in addiction or in poverty is a di different motivators uh, than middle class and rich people. So I'm wondering, Diego, if you can talk a little bit about what kinds of process 
um, you all go through in de in campaign development about uh, you talked about testing with focus groups, um, any sort of national networks you, we are involved in that help us understand and do better public education and engagement stuff. I'll ask all my questions and then um, uh, uh, leave it all to you. And then I don't often quote Donald Rumsfeld, but he said there are <laughs> there are known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns. And I guess I'm wondering on the epidemiology side, like what are the things we wish that we knew um, but don't have access to that would help us make better decisions? And then that made me think about um, whether uh, what we did with COVID and wastewater, whether wastewater has any future um, implications for understanding addic um, drug use in our communities. Uh, and I think those are my, I think those are my three questions. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Beeson. I can speak to the I guess, communications approach on that. Um, you know, there's, we've looked at studies, national studies, for example, the one that cites that 90% people who struggle with addiction don't seek recovery support because of the social stigma and the judgment they feel. Um, we know that there's 22 million Americans in recovery, and so really normalizing that seems to be a national approach that has been, you know, vetted and approach that has been taken by a number of cities and counties. We've worked closer, specifically or locally, to make sure that our messages land with whether it's youth, whether it's peers, whether it's the community at large, um, with our partners like Lines for Life, Recovery Network of Oregon, the Office of Consumer Engagement. These focus groups do give us kind of individualized and more specific local data that we can then use to inform the campaigns. And we've worked really closely with, for example, King County. They have similar trends in terms of data, similar population, similar, um, yeah, similar things that are happening there that really reflect our community as well. And so a lot of the research that they've done not just focus groups, but also message testing and things like that. They've shared, we've collaborated closely to ensure that we're taking a big scan of this, but then ultimately we know what's gonna resonate with our community, our messages that are grounded in reality here, that are local assets, whether it's featuring a bridge or featuring Mount Hood or something that really makes that real and poignant for the folks that live in Multnomah County. I think that's something that we've really have, have felt as we've solicited this content. And I think that the importance can't be understated of making sure that these campaigns are iterative, staggered, and adaptable as the conversation evolves, right? We've talked a little bit about billboards. That's a starting point. Those are conversations that happen as people drive around time and engage with an asset for five to seven seconds. But the message has to fit the medium. How do we make sure that we're telling more poignant stories about real people in recovery, people that are now community leaders that are breaking that stigma, that are shining through to encourage others to do the same thing? Um, but I'm happy to follow up with you with, with the specific research and, and things that we've parsed through, if that's helpful. Thank you. And I can speak to your um, unknown unknowns. Um, sometimes I think of epidemiology as feeling a bit like chasing a ghost because there's always a time lag. There's always, we're o it works best in retrospect, looking at things that have already happened and also looking at the most severe outcomes. So the unknown unknowns right now would be what is happening with people who are currently using and what are what's happening with people who are currently at risk those data are very difficult to come by and to develop in those processes that I talked about without existing infrastructural systems so there are not recent data in those area and so that's the unknown unknown right now that would take quite a lot of, of time and effort to figure that out so the way that we're approaching that is by triangulating that information using the information that we do have focusing on what can we learn from the people that have unfortunately lost their lives to this? Um, that's, that's how we're approaching it so that we can glean some information about the unknown unknowns. I would also say that's why it's one of the, it's really important as we're doing our work to have the data, the analytics, the head, but also the community wisdom around that because that lag, um, being able to listen, being engaged people, that's going to tell us before we see it in our data what's happening and then and then what's behind that for folks. So I think in, in all of the efforts as we're pulling things together and talking about comprehensive strategies and all these things that sound like, okay, you know, and, and merging the right now and the long term, that having that community wisdom, having that data, having an understanding of research and best practice, um, and then having a sense of, you know, what's worked well, but also 
innovation are all things that are part of I see as four Venn diagrams um, with any of the, the things that we're working on. All right, thank you very much. Thank you all so much for the, um, the information, the presentation, but most of all for all of the work that's happening to really elevate um, this issue in our community, but also like elevate the really positive messages that um, the campaigns are, are really um, rolling with and, and just the awareness and really looking forward to seeing some of those other um, campaigns as they roll out. And then um, I know we're all looking forward to seeing the, um, the dashboard come online on Monday. And I just really wanna appreciate Abby, your effort, but really everyone's effort at Unified Command of like really working together to try to get this data in a place that's, um, that's shareable and then that's, um, um, informative and, and really telling us, you know, what we want to see um, and doing it in a, such a public way. So I appreciate that. Thank you all so much. Thank you. All right, Marina, can we move on to R3? R3, informational briefing on the FY 2025 general fund five-year forecast. All right, so this is another um, informational one, but one that I know we all greatly look forward to every single year. I really appreciate the hard work that goes into these forecasts, especially at a time when you all and the budget team are working so hard um, helping us prepare for next year's budget. So I wanna thank both of you, Jeff and Christian, and all of the team in the budget office um, who are working so diligently right now behind the scenes um, with my office um, and for all the leadership and guidance um, to us, uh, to our departments as we're moving through this budget process, which really is like a full year process. Um, these continue to be challenging and volatile economic times, which is one of the things that makes this forecast so important and meaningful is just really to get an understanding of the sense of where we are. Um, I will want to make one mention about the material that we're covering today. Um, the board will notice that the BHRC is no longer called out in this forecast with a backfill amount as it was in the forecast provided in fall of last year. Um, as we've been working closely with our health department, we've identified a path forward that makes this carve out no longer necessary. So we'll um, have more information about this investment when my executive budget is released on April 25th. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Christian and Jeff um, to begin today's presentation. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, for the record, I'm Jeff Renfro. Uh, you see him pronouns uh, from the budget office. Uh, if we wanna go to the next slide, Marina. Um, and then just go to the next one, please. Um, so I, I'll start by saying we're not making significant changes, so this is gonna be a lot briefer than I, I typically am. Um, but I wanna start with just some high-level context. Um, so over the past few weeks, the, the recent kind of big economic releases have um, reflected some um, trends that sort of counter each other uh, and sort of muddy our expectations about the, the near-term future. The first one is that the last inflation number that came out showed an uptick in inflation again. It wasn't huge, and we're still far away from the peak in inflation we saw before. Um, but this last little bit of inflation that the Fed is trying to wring out of the economy is proving to be really stubborn. Um, this is good for our interest revenue, which we'll talk about later, but it's bad for our personnel costs. And based on the structure of how the county's finances work, that's a, that's a bad trade-off for us. So for us, our long-term risk continues to be personnel costs. We need inflation to come down, otherwise the sort of fundamental model of how cities and counties in Oregon work just kind of doesn't pencil out. The other thing I wanna point out here is um, we had another month of a really strong jobs report. Um, it's, uh, multiple months in a row now that we've had that. Um, but when you look beyond the headlines and the most recent jobs report, it also included big retroactive revisions to the last several jobs report that significantly reduced the number of jobs we think we created over the last few months. Um, so what that means is that, um, you know, if, if you're the Fed and you're trying to balance your dual mandate of controlling inflation but also maximizing employment, you see employment maybe slowing down, employment growth slowing down, and you start to think about cutting rates, but then you have this stubborn level of inflation that's still hanging on, and you're maybe even thinking about doing one more rate increase. Um, so uh, they just announced that they're holding steady for now, but going forward, that interplay between what's going on with jobs and what's happening with inflation is gonna dictate their path forward, which is going to have huge macroeconomic impacts for us. Um, 
The uncertainty continues to be related to property values downtown. We had a long discussion about this um, in November, but I'll just say that official vacancy rates are, are catching up to reality. And what I mean by that is we have a lot of space downtown that no one is coming to on a regular basis, but it's still leased. So it doesn't show up in official vacancy rates. So the expectation is that vacancy rates will continue to climb, but that reflects the kind of reality on the ground. And then finally, um, new census data came out. Uh, just last week, I believe, and it showed uh, another year of population decline in Multnomah County. It was a lot less than the last two years um, of declines as reflected by the census, um, but I keep getting questions about the census numbers versus the population research numbers. The PSU Population Research Center shows a really modest growth. I think from my perspective, the difference between very modest growth and a very modest decline is not really meaningful. I get that you know, the difference between a black number and a red number makes people feel differently about it. But I think the takeaway is that we have a, a very low level of growth or decline, which is basically an assumption of flat population growth going forward. If we wanna to go to the next slide, please. Um, so we'll go into the changes for the current year. Um, we're just making two in March, uh, and it's just a coincidence that they offset each other. The first one is we're reducing the property tax forecast by $3 million. Um, based on the data, it looks like our delinquency is just a little bit higher than what we were expecting. The out years of the forecasts include um, an assumption that delinquency will increase a little bit over the next couple of years. Based on the data, it looks like it's just showing up a little bit earlier than what we expected. I will say over the last few years, collections in June has been kind of all over the place. So I think that there's a chance that we end up making this up in June, but we're far enough in the year that I think it's appropriate to reduce our assumption here. Um, and then the second change is down on the bottom. We're increasing our um, uh, forecast for interest revenue by $3 million for the current year. I'm gonna talk about a change for next year in a little bit. Um, but our interest revenue is, is based on a few things. And to come up with this number, I work really closely with Eric and our treasury team. So the macroeconomic interest rates have an impact on this, but then the way it actually flows through to our revenues is based on how our treasury team is implementing our financial policies. So they're um, investing our available funds and they're doing it on different timeframes. So how those interest rates flow through to our revenues is pretty complicated and I really rely on our treasury team to kind of interpret what they've done and what our expectations are going forward. Um, so overall, no net change in the March forecast. Next slide, please. Even though we're not changing uh, the business income tax or the BIT right now, I wanna highlight a couple of things. Um, uh, I think the fact that I'm not making significant changes in the forecast reflects that economic data is sort of returning to normal and we're not getting these big swings all over the place. So now we're back into a situation where the BIT is our, our really volatile revenue source. So the red line in the middle is the path of collections for the current year and then that uh, peach line on top of it is the path of collections for last year. So you'll see that we're currently running about $9 million behind where we were last year. Our expectation for the year is we end up basically at the same place our collections were last year. Um, so um, the, the reason um, I, I still think we're going to end up there and we're not changing the forecast is we've talked about this a little bit, but following the federal tax reform during the Trump administration, our quarterly payments from the BIT have switched from being forward-looking to backwards-looking. Um, and I'll, I'll have a graph that illustrates some of our thinking here um, in a second, but um, there was a decrease in corporate profitability last year that was reflected in our collections, which declined between fiscal year 22 and 23. So our quarterly payments we're getting up to this point in this year still reflect that decline in profitability. But if we look at the data, there's been a pretty quick recovery. So the expectation is that once we get to April, we'll start to see payments that reflect the return to a higher level of profitability. So I, I think the important question is here is um, to, to the question of can we make up a $9 million gap by the end of April? Absolutely, no doubt in my mind that's possible. Uh, will we do that? Yes, I'm pretty confident about that, um, but it's the BIT, so there's a little bit of unknown here, so I just wanna kind of highlight the risk. Um, if we wanna go to the next slide, please. So this is a graph showing US corporate profits um, pre-tax, and um, the, the little decline and then recovery on the right side of this is what I'm talking about. So 
The peak on the right side corresponds to that record level of growth in collections we had in fiscal year 2022. The decline in our revenues in fiscal year 2023, was ba the timing was based on that trough there. Um, and then the uh, recovery and profitability just I think is not fully reflected in our payments yet and will start to be in April. We wanna go to the next slide please. So this is an update on our assumptions for the five-year forecast. Uh, the chair already mentioned that um, we've taken out the line associated with the BRC, BHRC. Um, and then the ongoing funding gap line for SB 1145 is up on the top. We've updated that to reflect the changes made by the legislature. I'm gonna sort of pass on talking about that since I think Justin is gonna talk to you about that at length uh, later in this board meeting. But so um, the blue line is an updated November forecast based on changing the BHRC and SB 1145 assumptions. Um, I do wanna note that um, if you look at our public documents and you go to our website and you look at our program offers right now, because all of those program offers were submitted in February, that's before the legislature took action. So you won't see um, changes in those SB 1145 assumptions reflected in our official documents. Um, that will be incorporated in the chair's budget. So DCJ and the sheriff's office will make those changes. Um, and then you'll see updated program offers at that point. So the changes we're making uh, in the five-year forecast for March are in between the blue and the orange line. The first one is um, we're also bumping up our interest uh, revenue assumption for fiscal year 2025 by $2 million. Um, so we're still following the same basic set of assumptions that interest revenue will peak and then as interest rates fall, our revenue will decline um, beyond that. So we're just kind of calibrating what we think, where we think we'll be over the next couple of years. Um, because we're expecting deficits, our assumption is we'll use that revenue increase as one time only, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, the middle adjustment, the PERS HB 4045 impact, so this is the one that um, moved some state employees from non-uniform to uniform per status and then lowered the retirement age for firefighters and police officers. Um, so the expectation is that this will increase our PERS rates starting um, in the next biennium, which will hit us in fiscal year 2026. Uh, the fiscal note on this was really clear that these were not great estimates and that the PERS actuaries needed to fully update their model. So at this point, this is our best guess about what the impact will be for us, but we'll continue to update this as PERS releases more information. And then the last line is, for fiscal year 2025, we'd assumed a cost of living adjustment of 3.7%. The actual number came in at 3.3%. Um, this is the first time while I've been at the county where I've been off by enough that we thought we needed to sort of pull those savings back. Um, so that's an ongoing savings in the general fund of about uh, almost $1.8 million in fiscal year 2025. Um, and because it's ongoing personnel costs, it flows out to the rest of the forecast. So when you um, put all of that together, uh, our expected deficit for fiscal year 2025 is now $3.9 million. That grows to $32.8 million by the time we get out to fiscal year 2029. And then one thing I wanna note based on some questions we've had recently is the way that we present this forecast is we basically assume that we continue to spend at the current service level for the life of the forecast. Um, so because we're expecting deficits, we can't do that, right? We're gonna have to make changes. So fiscal year 2025 by law will be balanced when the chair releases her budget. So that will reduce our deficit by about $4 million. So then the expectation is in fiscal year 2025, instead of almost $20 million, that would be more like $16 million. And then in 26, once we close that gap, then in 27 and beyond, we're, we're back in a position where we're like closer to balanced, where you know I could be off on a forecast and we could end up in better shape. Um, but really 2026 is gonna be the, the tough year here. If we wanna go to the next slide, please. So an update on one-time only funds. Um, in November, when we left you, we were expecting $54 million of one-time only. Um, just as a quick reminder, that's made up of fiscal year 2023 underspending, any errors I made in the forecast in fiscal year 2023, plus the current year changes uh, to the forecast in fiscal year 2024. The change we're making here is adding that fiscal year 2025 interest revenue change of $2 million from the last slide. 
Um, because interest revenue is part of our corporate revenues, which is what we use to calculate our reserve, I need to take a portion of that to fully fund our reserve at the board policy level, which leaves us at $55.8 million. By board policy, we'd split that in two and have $27.9 million for facility and IT capital projects, and then $27.9 million to be allocated. If we want to go to the next slide, please. This is an update on the contingency available for the current year. Um, the top section is our unearmarked contingency. That um, $2.2 million incorporates the $327,000 that the board um, sort of earmarked in our SB 1145 hearing uh, earlier in the year. And then that section uh, down below it is our earmarked uh, contingency from the adopted budget, um, and it reflects board action taken up to this point. If we want to go to the next slide, please. Um, I'll move quickly through this. So no net change in the current year forecast. We still have a contingency balance in the current year of $1.9 million if you pull out that um, SB 1145 earmark. Uh, deficit of $4.2 million for the forecast for 25 expected, which grows um, by the time we get to fiscal year 2029. Um, and then we've already talked about inflation and property values as being our major risks. Two really quick notes before I finish. If we want to go to the next slide, please. Um, we've put a summary of our budget milestones in the presentation, just so you know kind of where we're at and where we're headed. And then if you want to go to the last slide, please, Marina. Um, this is just a plug for the budget office's new fiscal year 2025 budget dashboard. Uh, this is a really cool tool put together by some of my colleagues. It is all the information I think you could possibly want about the fiscal year 2025 budget. Um, one thing in particular I want to point out is there's a, a tab in here that lets you recreate program offers, and then it lets you bring in information that's not in the paper program offers, so you can sort of customize the information that you're seeing. This is also available to the public, um, so we just want to make sure everyone knows about it and um, knows how useful it is. Um, so with that, I uh, will stop, and we're happy to take any questions about the forecasts or anything else. Great. Thank you all so much for the presentation. Always interesting. I love it. Um, we'll go to the board for questions. I will say that we are going to move the government relations update to the um, April 4th meeting, just in interest of time, so just um, so we um, are all aware of that. Um, and Commissioner Myron, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, I always appreciate hearing from you, uh, and I do not have questions at this time. Thank I you, will. Commissioner Beeson. No questions. Thank you, Commissioner Brim Edwards. So I had a qu couple questions. Well, I'm going to first start, start by saying the dashboard is amazing. Um, <laughs> I loved uh, playing for it, and I really appreciate um, the explanation of how it works. Um, so I'm looking forward to using it through, through the budget, budget process. Um, a quick question. So this is general fund, so it does not include the preschool for all dollars? That's correct. And it does not include the SHS dollars? That's correct. So. Um, this, as we move into the budget process, especially when we move into years in which um, we have a growing budget gap, this is just um, a suggestion or something I think that would be helpful is to have an all funds budget because it's confusing, I, I think, for the general public um, when they read, like, there's this excess surplus or we have record um, receipts coming in and and yet we're saying, and we're gonna be in a cuts year or a constraint years and not having restricted funds that seem like they may be available. And this is a classic thing that happens with the school district as well, um, where you have dedicated funds that um, seem like they could take care of another budget gap, um, but they're not available. And um, I just think we're, we're gonna have a lot of conversations that we're gonna need to have because there have been, especially the SHS dollars that were both unanticipated and the underspend, um, even though it was last year, there were a lot of headlines about it. Um, so having community conversations about that throughout the year, not just at one time only, I think is, is gonna be helpful for the community to know um, how we're gonna be able to approach the shortfalls. So just, um, I, I really appreciate this information, um, but it also tells me there, from a communication standpoint, um, we're gonna have to have lots of conversation with the community for them to understand that um, the general fund is different than these other pots of money. And also, you know, 
are there are there ways that we can use um, the general fund differently, knowing that we have these other funds? Um, I think it's gonna also going to be a conversation we need to have. Um, but I really appreciate the information. It was good that there wasn't um, a big swing this year. Great. Well, thank you all. I know you have lots of work to do, so I don't have any questions either. Just appreciate it, and we'll see you this afternoon. Can I just add one thing? Sorry, Christian Elkin, yep. Budget Director, for the record. Uh, you she, her pronouns. The dashboard that we daylighted, which is, is amazing, and um, my staff are I'm so proud of the work they've been doing around this to try to use this as a communication tool. We will retire that when the submit when the chair releases her budget, and we will put a new dashboard up that represents the uh, decisions and what's in the proposed budget, so that we don't cause confusion in the community about the different the two different dashboards. We'll still have all the static documents related to the submitted budget, but we'll just retire that dashboard. Great, thank you for that update. All right, we're going to move on to our four. We're, we've had the DA who's been rating very patiently all all morning so I really appreciate that um, R4 budget modification MCDA 00424 adding 1.0 FTE DDA and 2.0 FTE DA investigator position to TriMet contract good morning commissioners oh. my name oh sorry can I have a motion Commissioner Commissioner Ryan moves Commissioner Brim Edward seconds approval of R4 Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, good morning. My name is Mike Schmidt. I'm the Multnomah County District Attorney uh, and here to talk to you uh, in succession about two budget modifications. The first one has to do with a contract that we have with TriMet. Uh, we have had a contract with TriMet for a number of years now funding a Deputy District Attorney position that focuses on uh, any kind of cases and crimes that come out of TriMet. Um, they uh, have been uh, very uh, happy with the work that we've been doing and wanted to increase that contract to add one more deputy district attorney and two investigators. Uh, the DDAs will carry caseloads that are just related to TriMet cases and the investigators work with uh, other TriMet safety personnel, sheriff's office, other law enforcement uh, to help put together cases uh, that come out of any crimes that occur on TriMet. So asking for your approval to uh, to modify our budget to accept that contract revenue. All right, thank you very much. Um, we do have a little bit of public testimony on this item, so if you guys wouldn't mind taking a seat but staying close, we'll go to the board comments or questions right after. We have uh, Charles Johnson, Jared Essig, and Lightning. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Bridge Crane, Charles Simka Johnson, and uh, it's nice to finally get to an item where the public can engage. Uh, where are we? We're at uh, 2.5 hours into the meeting uh, since the public comment started. Um, you'll probably need to do uh, what Mr. I, I've marked on the little piece of paper that, of course, I'm in favor of this. One of the reasons you also should be in favor of it is just yesterday, during our fentanyl emergency, on the north side of the library, three bright, shiny, white SUVs labeled transit police are talking to people on, well, they're talking to people on your property, not TriMet property. I don't know what's going on there. Um, I guess that's part of unified command. Um, any police can uh, write tickets telling people you should go to substance abuse beds that aren't available yet. Um, and uh, that raises another issue about if we have this much capacity inside the DA's office for only TriMet specific issues, uh, and that leaves out whether I should add in my videos of the people sitting in the seat across from me with a piece of foil under their face and a torch on TriMet, I haven't seen that for a little while, so it's maybe there's some improvement there. Um, and uh, we also know that uh, going back to Thanksgiving of 2022, uh, TriMet is making like useless arrests of people who are disabled. And those people go through the judicial process over a long period of time, have some of their charges dismissed. I'll be discussing that particular case uh, with the DA at another time. But uh, when you vote, to take TriMet's money here, I think is really what we're doing. Uh, 
You also need to think about the capacity in the DA's office for the crime of killing people with fentanyl. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Peterson, commissioners and citizens of Multnomah County and District Attorney. My name is Jared Essig. I'm representing the Rose City Iron Front. We are a um, nonpartisan public interest, uh, political and direct action group defending constitutional government, rule of law, and Republican democracy. And I'm grateful to finally have the opportunity to speak to um, our chief law enforcement officer about why we should value the rule of law over the value of big men with guns, or over the rule of big men with guns, or over the rule of uh, mobs with raised fists, or with nooses hung from trees. Now, the role of the district attorney and other law enforcement is to enforce the law and prosecute crime, but the role of the commissioners and other responsible adults like the um, school board and the newspapers of record is to explain to the public, to the public the public education that I just mentioned and do the prevention and to explain why we should value the rule of law so that witnesses come forward so that victims first report crime. And this is the reason, the, 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 this uh, lack of public education is part of the reason why we have a crime epidemic and a murder epidemic in Multnomah County, which is the real emergency underlying the fentanyl crisis. And to abate that, um, we need to first restore that. I mean, if I go into the, the courthouse, I can't find anywhere a, the proposition that thou shalt not murder. And you know, maybe that should be something that you put on a billboard. Um, and I wanna ask the um, county attorney as well to give her an informed opinion on Article 1, Section 8 of the Oregon Constitution, which provides some of the most expansive prote free speech um, protections in, in the country, Thank but also says that anyone should be held re uh, responsible for the Thank abuse of this right. Yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning uh, Superhumanity X. Again, I uh, agree with DA Mike Smith on this budget mod modification. One of the things I want to emphasize when we're talking the people that are hired to be on there as security, I want to make sure that we get body-worn cameras on every one of them. I want to have access to the video, the audio. I want to be able to analyze it. I want to have community groups be able to analyze it, think tanks. And that to me is imperative when we're talking about Multnomah County Sheriff's Office or whoever they want to put into place on TriMet. Again, when we were talking with the committee on fentanyl, just one point I wanted to make, which as you know, you didn't allow public communication, is that I'd like to have Chair Peterson, my good friend, who has a background with Microsoft and the technology companies, to work alongside them on overdose detection, detection technologies such as a smartwatch, a wristband that they wear that analyzes their oxygen level, their heart rate, and when they get close to going into an overdose, an alarm automatically goes off. So we are providing anybody who has a fentanyl addiction with those wristbands to save their lives, to notify people around them that they do need assistance, so we don't bother them out of the blue if they're just sleeping, and they might get upset about that. We want to know when there is an emergency. We want to analyze the technology for overdose detection, such as the smart wrists, the, the wristbands they put on, different things from Apple, different things from other companies, why are we not talking about that? Thank you. Thank you. I hope you follow up on that because that saves lives. That is your job. All right. Now we'll go to commissioners for questions. We'll, go, we'll start with Commissioner Beeson. 
I have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Brim Edwards. So just to clarify, um, TriMet had paid for in the past one position, and this is adding three more, or is three in total? That, uh, it's correct, Commissioner. This will bring us to four in total. Four. Um, I'm very supportive, um, and I know this is much needed. Um, I would hope that uh, in future budgets, we would be paying for positions like this out of the general fund. Um, just from the, the concept of, um, I say, I think TriMet has a definite need, and um, you don't have the number um, of personnel in the office to, to, to adequate number to do the work. Um, I'm concerned, though, about um, long term having uh, positions paid for by specific groups that should be paid for out of our um, public resources. It's just, it, it can lead to, I'm not saying this is what happened, but it can lead to um, whoever pays um, has greater likelihood of having their cases pursued. And um, as a public entity, we should not have necessarily have that be the, the way in which um, people get um, cases um, pursued and uh, prosecuted. So I, I would just hope that um, we'd see a a healthy ask from your office to um, that we pay for it out of public public funds. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. No questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't have any questions either. So, Marina, can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Beeson. Yes. Commissioner Brim Edwards. Yes. Chair Vega Peterson. Yes. The budget modification is approved. R5, budget modification MCDA 00524, appropriating 83,380, uh, $83,348 in the Edward uh, Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant program funding for the State of Oregon Criminal Justice Commission. Commissioner Myron moves, Commissioner Brim Edward seconds approval of R5. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name again, Mike Schmidt, Multnomah County District Attorney, and here today on uh, the R5 budget modification uh, to accept money from the Criminal Justice Commission specifically to assist us with doing expungement work. Um, we worked in the legislature several years ago to get the expungement laws expanded and passed. Uh, that was successful. Uh, what that meant, though, for our office is a from going from processing about 1,500 expungements annually to 11,000 uh, expungements annually. Um, so these positions uh, are courtesy of the Criminal Justice Commission for, via the governor's office to support us helping get through the backlog of just the massive amount of expungements that we are now uh, processing, which is a good thing. Uh, we just need the resources to be able to do it. Okay, great. We'll go to the board with any questions. Oh, wait, actually, we do have public testimony on this, correct? Yes, okay. uh, we have Charles Johnson, uh, Jared Essig, and Lightning. Good morning. Thank you again. I'm Charles Simcoe, Bridge Crane Johnson, and, uh, you know, this is great news. Uh, probably one of the reasons that uh, the Honorable District Attorney didn't bring anyone from the PCC Clear Clinic here is because they're incredibly busy. Uh, during the war on drugs and other uh, excessive policing efforts, uh, our community racked up a lot of people who need expungement services. Uh, Clackamas County has uh, some nonprofit connection that's doing it. Uh, there's other resources besides I think, the PCC Clear Clinic, but it's great, you know, the main thing about this, these are the best kind of agenda items because it's money coming from outside the county into the county, so obviously you're gonna say yes uh, and take this money. Um, uh, there are some question about uh, people who've previously filed for expungement and then just had that sort of stuff disappear, and whether that's related to case 22 CR 56514 or not, we'll find out later. Um, and the flow of arrestees through TriMet and whether that's really building safety on TriMet. Um, but, uh, Holistically, uh, all this money may be to no effect because the district attorney didn't have time to mention that he will occasionally have to bulk uh, dismiss cases because our state cannot fund and build uh, adequate public defender service. 
So uh, when you're talking to the people, and I don't, we didn't really hear anything about that that I know of in the last legislative update, uh, but I do know that in the media twice in the last two or three years, uh, I think over 100 cases have had to be dismissed. And I'm not a big fan of uh, criminal penalties, but those defendants probably had uh, mental health, behavioral health issues that won't get addressed and will lead to their rearrest. So while we take this uh, $83,000 uh, and build ourselves a uh, fentanyl paradise where we don't stop fentanyl from coming in here and the problem will continue to get worse until we reduce the flow of fentanyl into this county. Thank you. Uh, take this money. <laughs> Hello again, my name is Jared Essig. Um, we opposed, well, we, 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 during 2020, we support police reform, and that includes reform of the DAs and accountability for police, too. And that's why we campaigned with many groups for 26217 for the Community Board of Police Oversight and Accountability. Um, but as I was saying, um, we need to do better public education and prevention. Youth are exposed daily to some form of the argument that might makes right and that salvation is obtained through joining a mob and destroying something or through an orgy of uh, sexual violence aimed at butt raping the police or something like that. And this disgusting um, uh, ideology has to be uh, addressed in order to deal with the crime epidemic. Um, so. Yeah, I support police reform, but the radical police abolitionist agenda, and even worse, the, cr the incitement and the rioting that came with it are the probable cause for this crime and murder epidemic. This is why I say FTP means to me free the people or fight the power. It doesn't mean that you should butt rape the police or the president or any other elected official. That's disgusting or perverted. And two weeks ago, someone came to this seat and incited the uh, audience to butt rape the seated president and that was vicious and perverted and you should have rebuked him for it and he's going to speak right after me so he can uh, he can see he, he can apologize if he wants to now the county attorney should give an opinion a legal opinion on whether or not you are authorized to take executive action to enforce the law incitement to crime obscenity and threats of violence are not protected under the u.s or oregon constitution and i defy either of you to say otherwise now, it starts with education. Before you enforce the law, teach people what it is and teach people why we should value that. If you incite crime, people are going to act it out, and then you're going to deal with this after the fact. These are reactive solutions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Just let him touch me. Don't touch me again. Don't ever put your hand on me. Yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Humanity X. For the previous speaker to praise President Biden when he's killing babies and children in Gaza by funding the weapons to do it, you need to rethink what freedom of speech really is. Now, getting to the subject, I agree again with the DA and the funding on the, ex and again, what I wanted to focus on also is that when you had your economic advisor come up here and talk about the economics of the county, he knows and I know as well, he's not taking consideration of the rapid value decreases of the commercial real estate industry and how that affects your budgets. If you follow numerous states like I do from New York and very other states on what they do, you'll see that they've had about a billion plus to $2 billion discount from their budget. You're gonna have the same, high numbers. Because what happens when those office real estate values begin to plummet and they go into bankruptcy and then you have to reassess the property values, that's all your tax base. And then when those buildings come up empty and you have all the retailers fleeing to other states, that's all your business tax rate. So when he's sitting here saying that, I'm saying to him, 26 and 27, you're gonna see something you never thought. These municipalities are gonna be crying for money, crying, and they're not gonna get it. So what do you have to do? 
you have to lay a bunch of people off. Those were failed policies of the past, and again, it does come back to the remote work where people are working from home instead of coming into the cities, and the retailers are leaving. So Thank you. again, your budget is upside down, just like Montgomery Park that sold originally in 2019 for 200. Questions. We'll start with Commissioner Brum Edwards. No questions. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. No Commissioner Beeson. Uh, no questions for me. I'm just glad we have some state dollars to help with the backlog of these really um, important cases, especially because it was a result of some of the state's actions in the first place. Um, but I don't have any questions, um, so we'll have a roll call vote. Aye. The budget modification is approved. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for waiting. Um, all right. Now we're at the end of the agenda. As I mentioned earlier, we will bring back our government relations team for the legislative overview on short session on April 4th. Um, I know that they are happy to meet with uh, commissioners one-on-one -on -one before that. One-on-one uh, -on -one before that, um, if anyone would like that. Um, so we will go ahead and... Um, have time for board comment on non-agenda items. We'll see, does anyone have anything they want to discuss? Commissioner Myron. Thank you, Chair. Um, I uh, wanted to, um, first of all, uh, thank Christina Nieves from my office who did an amazing job with the uh, Trans Day of Visibility arranging and I did not publicly acknowledge her and I can't believe I did that. So. She's not even sitting here now, but she's amazing and did so much work. So thank you, Christina. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to just mention something that I um, hope to talk to each of you about when we check in or whatever. But uh, as we are working on, uh, on stuff for the homelessness response plan, um, I'm worried about the timing and being sort of having to make a decision by um, whenever the joint office uh, IGA would expire and we'd have to adopt something in its place uh, at that time. And I worry that because this is so complex, I still have so many questions that are substantive stuff, funding, administrative governance. Um, I feel like we should have a safety net that if it's not decided by the time the joint office agreement expires that we have the opportunity to at least extend the joint office agreement just as a technicality to make sure that we don't run into a situation where we're forced to adopt, um, you know, vote on something that maybe we haven't fully agreed on or it's not the right thing just because the deadline is coming up and if we don't vote for another thing then some financial implosion may occur or something so I, I feel like we could extend the joint office IGA it'll be it, there's no downside it's moot if we do what we're intending to and adopt the plan a different plan to replace it so there's no downside in having it but if we don't if there's still negotiation or things happening, at least we can have that extra week or two, whatever it would take without um, a whole dysfunction of all of the county services. And I heard it would be really bad. So I, I just wanted to put that out there so that we can meaningful deliberate on this important community issue. Thank you. Commissioner Beeson. No comments, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brennan Edwards. Thank you. Uh, just three quick things. Um, I arrived at 9.35 and missed the vote on the consent agenda, and I understand that I can't vote um, afterwards, um, but I do want to just note for the record that, um, and I haven't included, that I would have voted in favor of the consent agenda, so I'm sorry I was um, late and missed that. And then um, just a comment about the earlier, as I was sitting here thinking about the presentation we had, um, I think we really should re rethink the camping um, ad because we 
have spent so much time and a lot of resources sending a message to our community about camping. It just seems ironic and sort of tone deaf to have um, something, somebody dreaming about camping in recovery when there's a lot of other messaging or, and people may have been in a situation where they're homeless and camping and that we're saying that that's the destination. So I just think we, that should be rethought. Um, and then I also want to share, I spent a couple, um, a couple hours last night in Montevilla at a community meeting uh, that around the safe park and pods um, site that is proposed um, at 333 Southeast um, 82nd. And I want to thank the joint office for showing up and providing a presentation and offering, um, presenting what the plan is, um, answering some of the questions. There's obviously an, a fair amount of uh, additional questions that will be as we move ahead. They still need to be answered, but I wanted to um, share that the community is asking for a five block um, sort of no camping zone around the, the site, and I realize that is the, a city ordinance. Um, the city wasn't there last night, but I just want to flag that because that, um, there's a lot of concern because it is literally adjacent to people's homes um, that the actual site, while it may be on 82nd, the back side of it is uh, adjacent to people's homes and also across the street. Um, so that'll be something that I want to come back and have a conversation with um, the commission about. And then um, I also want to elevate um, the f some of the voices that were um, present last night because uh, many of the issues that um, are raised in terms of li livability for downtown and old town were issues that were raised last night. And the sense that um, as downtown is being focused on and addressed that um, there's a pushing east of, instead of addressing it, a pushing east of um, the individual um, issues that are just playing out in the community. And so I, I since it was raised that there was data that that's not happening. I really would like to see it because that needs to be shared with the community because um, definitely a sense of we don't have the same power and the and political muscle that um, downtown has, that, but that um, the problems are just as real for people living in neighborhoods in East Portland and the people living on the streets without access to services. Um, so I just want to elevate that and I do want to see the data because um, we need to be um, addressing uh, the crisis on the street with not just moving it. So, so. thank you. I'm sure um, Abby will be happy to provide that. Um, so I just want <clears throat> to reflect that we had over 40 candidates who attended our first ever Multnomah County 101 session right here in the boardroom on Tuesday. Um, this was a chance for many of the candidates who are running for office at Multnomah County or the city of Portland to get an overview of the county's work and the specific work and purview of individual departments as well. So I wanna um, extend my gratitude to 14 presenters. They were department directors, the DA, the auditor, and others for taking on the task of answering most of the frequently asked questions about their departments um, and work. And I really wanna give a special shout out to COO Serena Cruz and her team for the thoughtful management of this event that was actually her idea and I think it was a really nice way for candidates to understand a little bit more about what um, the work of the county is. Um, I wanted to remind the community that our Homelessness Response Action Plan feedback period is continuing now through March 29th. Um, we'd love folks to take a moment to weigh in. I know we've already had several, um, several folks who've, um, who've given feedback. Anyone with comments can email county staff at hrapfeedback at maltco.us. So hrapfeedback at maltco.us. The comment period will also include a virtual town hall for the general public tonight at 7 p.m. So I encourage folks to attend as well if they're interested. Um, all of the information about this, as well as um, a way to um, find that email address, um, sign up for the town hall is at maltco.us slash hrap. And then um, just two more things. I wanted to take a moment to announce the positive momentum in our negotiations around our next steps with our ambulance response. Last Friday, March 15th, leaders from the American Medical Response and Multnomah County's Health Department concluded a full day mediation process focused on improving ambulance response times following county fines against AMR for missed performance benchmarks. 
Um, progress was made in the initial mediation center uh, session and both Multnomah County and AMR are, continued to, are committed to continuing discussion, collaboration, and to serving Multnomah County at the highest level of care possible. So to build on that positive momentum, a second mediation session is in the planning stages for next month and more information will be available on that in um, the next couple weeks. And last but not least, I hope everyone taking time away for family or travel over spring break has a wonderful, relaxing, and safe vacation. Board meetings and briefings are canceled for spring break, so we will see you back here next week on April 2nd. And with that, that concludes today's business, and we are adjourned.